I'm going to talk today some more about self-determination theory, uh, obviously, and, uh, but I want to take up some different topics than I did before, but just in doing so, I want to begin by maybe reviewing a couple points that uh, we made this morning. So part of what we were beginning with this morning is a question, and I think it's a question that really is at the heart of all of coaching. It's certainly at the heart of what I do as a clinician and as a father and as a uh, boss at a workplace, because I have a company as well. In all those roles, I'm trying to help the people around me flourish. And I think this is what we all would like to do as generative people in the world when we can do that. And certainly, facilitating adult development is really about the process of flourishing. We have to ask, what do people need to flourish? When we look at this plant, we can say, well, the plant has some needs that are pretty obvious and objective. So if we don't give this plant water, it won't thrive. If it doesn't have sunlight, it won't thrive. And in the same way, we think that the psyche, the human psyche, has some basic nutrients which, deprived of them, it will not thrive. We think it's in everybody's nature to flourish. It's already built into us. We're endowed with the capacity, not just the capacity, but the propensity, the energy, the spirit to do that. Again, every child, no matter what the abilities they bring into this world, wants to discover and learn. My own work started in developmental disabilities where I worked with very severely and profoundly delayed people. And in every one of them, there was an intrinsic motivation to learn about the world around them and to discover the things that they could discover. All of us have this richly built into us. The trouble is it gets crushed over time or it gets stifled in us in time because our needs are not met. Just as an example of that, if we trace intrinsic motivation and interest in learning in school children, when they come in at kindergarten, it's very, very high. It's always at the top of our scales and our observational measures. Over the years of school, a linear trend downward with two big dips in it, one between third and fourth grade, and the other when they enter middle school at whatever age that is, two big dips in motivation, but otherwise a linear trend downward. What are we doing for, with children such that they're learning not to be interested in learning? This is something that we need to take stock in. And what do they need? to take it another way. So while it's built into us to flourish, while every one of us has that capacity and that, uh, that energy, it's also something that does not happen automatically. It requires supports from our environment and, uh, and, uh, and nutriments that, uh, that we get socially. And again, if you were at the talk this morning, I won't repeat too much of this, but in our very basic list of nutriments, we say there are three, autonomy, competence, and relatedness. Now, why do we get to these three? There's no magical number three here. There could be four or five. We debate these things all the time. We've had various candidates uh, elected within our labs to fit with the criterion of needs. Um, but again, when we think of needs, we think of things that, oops, I don't have a slide on that. We think of things that are necessary, that would be independent of one another, enough to show incremental variance for that, that they would each make a difference in our lives. And if we were deprived of any one of them, we would be able to show objectively that people uh, go downhill in some way. And it's also important that the th something that's a need does not have to be valued by the person to be important to the person. So it could be, for instance, that I don't value eating well, I don't value, I don't like citrus, I don't like uh, fruits. It doesn't matter whether I don't value them. If I don't get vitamin C, I will suffer scurvy over time. It's an objective issue. And the same is true with some of our values. I work, for instance, uh, with some people who say, um, I don't need relatedness. I don't, I'm done with relationships in my life. That's not something I need anymore. And I hear that as a statement. It's a statement about being heard. It's a statement about being burned. But they still will not thrive unless they get relatedness. Recently, we've been doing studies with Bedouin women. And many Bedouin women will give voice to the idea that they don't need any freedoms and they don't need any control. And it's OK with them the arrangement that they're in. But we say, nonetheless, they suffer for their lack of autonomy. And we can find that objectively in their health outcomes, in their longevity, in their rates of depression, et cetera. So an important thing to think about a need is whether the person says they need it or not, they need it. And that's the criteria for it being a need. So when we, when we nominate other needs, uh, then they have to meet those criteria. And so far, we just haven't found any others. So for instance, the need for security comes up a lot, but it turns out not to be very predictive of anything. And it really only comes up when you're in positions of dire insecurity. The issue for meaning comes up, but we have other way Meaning doesn't add any variance above and beyond these other three. And we could talk about other needs, but we have these three because they work. 
uh, empirically and theoretically. And I discussed earlier what they were, the need for competence really being the need to feel mastery and, and control in the environment in your, which you're in. Relatedness, feeling like you're a significant person in your social context, like you belong and people care for you and you get to care for others as you grow into adulthood. And in autonomy, it's behavior that you endorse, that you self-endorse. Reflectively, when you're autonomous, you would, if you reflected on your behavior, you'd say, yep, I agree with doing that. We don't always have to be conscious to be autonomous. We can be autonomous even when we're doing unreflective things, automatic things. So, so I drive a standard car, for instance. When the engine sound gets to a certain point, I'm shifting. I'm not thinking about shifting. But if I were to reflect on that, I would say, yeah, I wanted to shift at that time. It's not about always being conscious, but it means that if you were conscious, if you did take that reflective step, you would agree with what you're up to. And that's self-endorsement of behavior. And as I said before, that's different from uh, some other ideas, it's different from independence. Uh, for instance, we can be autonomously dependent, we can be autonomously interdependent. I'm very, very dependent on my team members for all the work that we do in my company, Immersive. We work as a team, I think we all think of ourselves as a team, and we're all autonomously interdependent. We like that way of working together. But sometimes you want to do things on your own, that's when you would be autonomously independent. When you say, I want to do that by myself, that's also a possibility. But also when you want help from others, you can be autonomously dependent. So I really stress this separation because it becomes very important to much of our work in cross-culture and developmental to separate these two things. For instance, adolescents often crave independence, but they really need autonomy. And, uh, and independence gets them in trouble quite a bit if they don't rely on adults. So I want to talk a little bit about what adults would they rely on if they were to do so, because they want that volitional dependence. Do you, do you want to talk any questions? Yeah. I'll talk a little bit, and then I'll, I'm going to open it all up for questions. So I guess I'll save that a bit. Yeah. And then when I talked about autonomy, I really talked about the, uh, this earlier, so I just review it in brief, that it's really a continuum. We can really think about various kinds of motives we have, and we think this taxonomy captures many of the motives that us, all of us have. And so sometimes we're intrinsically motivated, we're excited and passionate about what we're doing. Sometimes we're doing it just because it's not fun, but we think it's valuable. This is what we call an identification. Sometimes we're doing it because we think we should and we'll feel bad if we don't or feel proud if we do. So it's self-esteem that is our motivator. I want to enhance my self-esteem so I'll do well at this or I don't want to uh, have a blow to my self-esteem so I won't fail. That would be introjection. And again, it's a powerful motive, but it's now uh, lacking in autonomy. You feel driven, pushed, compelled to do things. This is not a fun state of being. And then at the low end of autonomy is external regulation when you're pushed around by the rewards and punishments in your environment and you don't feel choice about what you're doing. So when you think about this as a continuum, then we're, when we think about autonomy, we really think about people operating out of the upper end of this, both out of a sense of value and interest, and that's when people are at their best. Um, I should mention down here in A motivation, sometimes people aren't motivated at all because they just don't see that trying will work, will get them outcomes. Sometimes withdrawing effort is a better thing to do than put effort in if you think you will fail. There are many contexts like that, so A motivation is, uh, is not even on this continuum. It's the absence of something that we might otherwise want. So using this continuum, we've been doing a lot of investigations of autonomy and really uh, one thing I should say is when we think about any given behavior that we have, usually we have multiple of these operating. So right now, as I'm talking to you, as I mentioned this morning, I, I really don't like giving public talks. I would rather be alone in my library reading my books or doing something like that because I'm an introvert by nature. But, so I have a lot of interjection around talking, which is I feel like I should do it and I feel horrible when I don't. So interjection powers a lot of my speaking behaviors. <laughs> uh, I also think it's important to self-determination theory and the work that self-determination theory represents to give talks publicly, to go around and do talks. So it's a value. So even though I don't find it that much fun, I do it out of that identification. And, and that fits with my other values. Well, most of my other values, not so much uh, being with my wife, but it fits with my other values to go around the world giving talks. So it's relatively integrated, which means I can be kind of wholehearted in doing it, at least except for my interjection. And then finally, uh, I, sometimes 
there's fun and interest that attends talk. I get to talk to interesting people. Uh, the talk itself is never intrinsically motivating for me, but the talk afterwards often is. So I say that by way of an example of it. We usually have mixed motives. Usually we have several of these, and we will tend to measure all of them. We add them up and look at the person's relative autonomy. Where is the configuration of their motivation? And you hope it's mostly up on the far end of this when we're thinking about motivation, because nobody's motivation is ever pure. Sometimes we're doing something for both a reward down at this bottom end and out of interest, and then those things will have a, a cumulative effect. So I spoke this morning about many of the positive outcomes that come from autonomy, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on that kind of data here. Uh, with more autonomous motivation, when we can facilitate it, we get many, many positive benefits from that. And these things hold up across ages, across socioeconomic status, across cultures, uh, really um, across all human beings. Why? Because, again, these are basic psychological needs, and autonomy is one of them. I just got back from a trip to Singapore and Hong Kong, and I can't tell you how much the idea of autonomy resonates with the people that I speak with there. In part, it's easier to talk about autonomy there than it is in the United States. Because often our conception of autonomy here is freedom from things. It's how we can get away from responsibilities or how we can escape somebody's control. But I think much more out of the Confucian tradition, we understand autonomy to be the absolute endorsement of the responsibilities I hold, the cultivation of my character such that I want to be doing the things that I also should be doing. When I have that, I'm fully integrated, and that's a high state of autonomy. So that's a better talk next door. <laughs> anyway. At least you laugh. Now they have some competition over there. <laughs> so having talked a lot about autonomy, I, I felt like I missed something this morning. You know, I only had 45 minutes. I'm not good in short periods of time. I wanted to talk about another need here, which is a need for relatedness. So I wanted to start with that. Uh, here just a bit to say autonomy is not the first thing that comes to most people's mind as a need. If you ask most people, the top thing they will say is that they want their intimate relationships. It's the loved ones in their life. That's the most important thing. We're, this is salient across the world to all of us. It's the universally most important value that we have is our relationships. And therefore, it's particularly surprising that we so often ignore it as a important element in our workplaces, in our school classrooms, uh, in, uh, in our sport uh, worlds. I uh, was a long time ago an athlete, and I never remember any relatedness on the athletic field. I only remember being scolded, yelled at, and, uh, and other things. I thought, the coach, why didn't he ever smile at us? It would have been a good thing. It's often a neglected part of motivation, because when you feel like you're in good relationships with other people, you want to do well. You want to listen to their perspectives. You want to take in their values. If we think about this developmentally, children take in, they naturally want to assimilate their parents' values as long as they are close to their parents. If they are attached and intimate with their parents, they want to emulate them. It's when they feel detached or separate from parents that they now don't want to take in their values and they want to take in someone else's to whom they would like to be attached. Attachment drives internalization. It's the most fundamental piece of internalization. And so it's so important to motivation. I want to say some things about it. Now, most of us have heard concepts of relationships. And one of the most common concepts out there is security of attachment. We say some people are securely attached and some people are insecurely attached. And we expect that people who are insecurely attached are insecurely attached with everybody because the model is that you learn this early on and that becomes your character and then you keep applying it in a working model to everybody else. But we don't ascribe to quite the same model in SDT. We think it's very contextual. We think you can have very secure attachments to even somebody you don't know very well, even if you generally are insecure in your attachments, if they supply the right nutrients. So this is, a, this is just a graph here of the way it goes really in our lives, which is if you take any individual in this room, uh, you could say, uh, let's say we take this person here in the front of the room and we look at each of his relationships, his relationship with his wife, his relationship with his friend, his relationship with his boss, his relationship with uh, people he hangs out on the weekend, all those different things. We'll find that in some of those relationships, he's very secure, very safe, feels very safe, can express what he wants to, feels close. Um, 
In other ones, maybe not so much. So in those relationships, he acts differently. Maybe not so extroverted. Maybe a little more um, self-conscious. Maybe a little more self-judgmental and self-controlling because you don't trust the people who are around you. Each one of us has this if we think about the different people in our lives. So what drives these differences? So the first thing I want to say is we've studied people's attachment to other people and we look at whether, uh, multiple relationships. And the first thing is if attachment people were right that once insecurely attached to parents, you stay insecurely attached to everybody, there would be all the variance would be between person. But what we find is it's a minority of the variance that's between person. Mostly attachment security varies within person, meaning there's more differences in my security of attachment from person to person than there is between me and other people. There's much more variance within us. And what's it a function of? Here's an example. These are college students in this particular uh, study that uh, came out in 2000. And here we just asked about their security of attachment. And you see a pattern that's pretty typical of American college students, which is they're very strongly attached to their mother. They're very strongly attached to their best friend. They have good attachment with their romantic partner. And they're about as closely attached to their father as they are to an arbitrarily assigned roommate. <laughs> It's really a sad, sad statement about fathers, but it's true in all of our research, which is insecurity of attachment with fathers is fairly pervasive in our culture. And luckily, people tend to be securely attached to mothers if they're in a good home. Now, one of the things that's interesting about that is if we look at security attachment, we take out relatedness need here because it's so overlapping with the idea of attachment that obviously it predicts attachment. So if you get rid of relatedness, who are you most attached to? And what this data shows is you're attached to whoever is supporting your autonomy and, and to some extent, competence. So even among fathers who tend to be uh, not good figures to attach to, fathers who are autonomy supportive have children who are very securely attached to them. Mothers who are, on the other hand, not autonomy supportive have children who are not attached to them. So the security of attachment has a lot to do with how much autonomy support a person feels. And it varies incredibly within person. Not only does security of attachment vary within person as a function of autonomy and competence, but so do all these other dimensions. So emotional reliance, who do you turn when you have a problem to? When we look at to whom people turn when they have an emotional upset or joy, we find it's the people in their lives to whom, uh, they, who support their autonomy. If I have a problem, the person I don't want to go to is the person who's going to tell me what to do. Because that's going to do two things to me. First, I may not like their advice, and now I'm in the position to not follow it. Also, it makes me feel incompetent. Because if they can just come up with the solution to my problem in a flash, in no, in no way is that what people, people want to go to the person who will listen, who will sympathize, who will empathize. And maybe, after all of that, offer some uh, opinions here and there. But mostly, it's about autonomy support. So within person, we go to the people. And we, and we find that this will be mother or father, depending on who's most autonomy supportive. It will be a teacher, if that's the person. It could be an employee in your workplace. It could be a friend. But it's that person to whom you turn. Also, to whom you disclose emotions generally, and particularly negative emotions. What we find is that uh, people will show positive or negative emotions more to people who support their autonomy. To people who are controlling, they won't show their whole self. We've been doing some cross-cultural studies of big five personality traits. And for people who don't know what they are, it's kind of the gold standard of trait variables within psychology. And the big five are. Uh, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, openness, and the negative end of it is the, of neuroticism. So those are the big five traits. And presumably, we all vary on these big traits. What we do is we look within person. And we first ask, how would you ideally like to be? Where would you like to be on these traits? And then where are you when you're with your mother? Where are you when you're with your boss? Where are you when you're with your uh, best friend in terms of those traits? And one thing we find, we found this now in Russian uh, samples, Chinese samples, US samples, and Scandinavian samples, that in all those samples, when you're with people who are autonomy supportive, you go closer to your own ideal as a person. You move toward the traits that you most value. And it turns out, across all those cultures, it's the same configuration. People would like to be more open. They would like to be more agreeable. They would like to be uh, more extroverted, because extroversion here doesn't mean sociality. It means that you feel energized and connected with people. And you'd like to feel less neurotic. The only one I didn't mention was conscientiousness, because that's a little 
funny as a variable, but the other four are all in the same direction. People would like more of those things, and they are more of those things when they're with autonomy supportive people. We look at relationship satisfaction, and it's strongly driven by autonomy support. If you ask people how satisfied are you in this romantic relationship, and you get a separate measure of autonomy support, it's hugely predictive. Uh, also true of vitality and energy in relationships. Most recently, we've been doing some work on uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender individuals. Uh, this study is with just uh, 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 GLB people. And we've been looking at, you know, we, we know from a lot of research that when people who are identified as gay or lesbian, when they have to hide that, it has a huge social cost on them. So it depresses their cognition because they have to constantly be monitoring themselves. It depresses their mood. It leads to negative affect and feelings of rejection. And so we've been interested in the fact that, well, well, then why doesn't everybody come out? What's the barrier to them coming out? And when we look at the barriers to coming out, we find it's about the feeling of being controlled, that some people will be judgmental and controlling toward them, and so they won't come out in those atmospheres. If we look at workplaces, for instance, where there's acceptance of gay, lesbian, bisexual people, those people tend to be happier, they have less negative affect, they're more productive. All kinds of positive things happen if they come out, but they will only come out if they feel that the atmosphere will be autonomy supportive. So again, we've done these within-person studies to show that a lesbian, gay, or bisexual individual will only be out with the people that they trust to be out with, and those are the people who support their autonomy. And they will pay a cost if they come out around controlling people with more anger and more negative affect. Just, I want to just show you how powerful autonomy is in relationships by a very simple study that we did, which was called How to Play a Game of Charades. So you think this, this, is, this is a serious scientific study. It's actually, it was called How to Win at a Game of Charades. And what we did is we had two people who did not know each other beforehand come into a laboratory setting. And just before they came into the laboratory setting, we did something to them which is we call a non-conscious prime. We used a semantic priming uh, uh, manipulation. So for some people they were doing, they were scrambling sentences that had lots of words like control, judgment, um, have to, must, uh, embedded in the sentences. They didn't know that this was the task and they were just straightening out the sentences. And others had a, an embedded autonomy prime where they had things like freedom, choice, autonomy, all embedded in things that they then had to uh, sort through. They thought it was a semantic task, which it was, but it primes those areas of the brain that would be associated with these motivational states. So it's through this magic of priming that we get to show this particular uh, causal effect of feeling more autonomy when you're in interaction with someone. So we brought people into a laboratory setting, and we hypothesized that people primed with autonomy would feel more close to people that they were playing charades with. They'd be more responsive in interactions because you can code this in charades games. They'd be more engaged in the activity and they would experience it with more positive uh, well-being. I'm going to fall off the stage yet. Just keep it if I keep it up. Every time I try and make a point, I move closer. <laughs> um, this was a setup in the laboratory. The people came in, they played charades. We had cameras all around because we were going to do a lot of behavioral coding on this. Um, so this was the result of the experiment. People primed with autonomy felt more close to the people that they were with. They had more emotional attunement. They tended to pick up on the other person's feelings, often giving voice to them. More cognitive attunement. They certainly did better at the charades task because they were more in line with what was being thought by the other person. They gave more explicit encouragement. There was more positive mood in the room, less negative mood in the room. They were more engaged in the task, and it turned out they won more at charades. This shows that just having that part of you that feels autonomy activated before entering into a relational setting improves the nature of relationships itself. So relatedness doesn't, is in part intertwined with autonomy and we find this very high correlation between them in almost all of our studies, which surprises a lot of people because some people think it's always antithetical. Because if you have relatedness, you have to give up autonomy. Or if you have autonomy, you give up relatedness. We don't think any of that's true. We think the best relationships are those where you have autonomy. It's when you're mutually autonomy supportive that you have the richest, deepest, authentic relationship with another person. And we show in lots of studies that it's the very social conditions in which I say, I'll only stay related to you if you give up your autonomy. In other words, you do things my way, I'll still approve of you, which many parents do to their children. We call it conditional regard. This sets up not only a lack of autonomy, but it sets up a poor trajectory of future relationships. I'll maybe go into that a little bit later. Oh, that's the wrong one. 
just wanted to say one thing about this is a study that, uh, that uh, Ed DC and Jennifer LaGuardia really uh, ran. Um, I was just a part of it here, in which the assumption was is that when you get autonomy support from a relational partner, this improves your well-being. And so we measured this, but we also wanted to look at when you give autonomy support to somebody else, does that benefit you? The reason this is important is because it goes back to our theory of relatedness, which is relatedness is not just about getting, it's also about giving. I feel more significant and connected when there's something I can give to you as well as getting things from you. And when I can support my partner's autonomy, when my wife comes home with issues, that I can actually take her frame of reference. I can listen from her perspective. I can provide choices that are meaningful to her if those are available. I can encourage her in the ways that I can do, which I'll go into around autonomy support. That that, in fact, will not only make her feel better, I will end up feeling better. And that's what this data shows. Uh, this is a very poor graphic of it here. But in here, it's both, you can see here that each person in a dyad is positively affected not only by the autonomy support they receive, but by the autonomy support they give, independently assessed here from that. In other words, we get by giving. Of course, we know this as coaches all the time. Part of what makes coaching a beautiful activity, and for me, being a clinical psychologist, makes therapy a beautiful activity, is I feel the generativity and the, the joy that comes from giving to somebody else. When I see progress in their life, I feel like, yeah, you know, I've had an effect. It increases my feelings of competence, it increases my feeling of connection to the person, and it also increases my autonomy. So we've made the argument that when we give to others, all three of our basic needs are met. And there's lots of evidence for this, and I'm just going to show you one. This is a, a study I did uh, with uh, Netta Weinstein. Actually, there's six studies in this series that are published together in one paper in JPSP. But this is just one of the studies. Uh, there were helping studies in which we contrived situations or studied in real life situations where people help one another. This is one of the contrived situations. So in this laboratory setting, people came in and they were given an opportunity to help another person. Uh, some people uh, were not given the opportunity, so they were in a no helping condition. Some people were put in a condition where they could help, but we told them they should help. You should help this person here. We evoke the interjection and pressure on them from outside to help, because we think it's a good thing that you do that. And that's, we call that the controlling condition. And the autonomy support condition is they were given an opportunity to help, but with no pressure to do so, so they chose to do so themselves. And then we look at what happens to them, and we find that in uh, conditions where they autonomously help, these gray bars here, that the helper feels more positive affect, the helper feels more vitality, and the helper feels more self-esteem. They feel better about themselves having helped. But interestingly, when they're autonomously helping, that's also when the recipient of help, even though they were not aware of the condition that the helper was in, the recipient of help somehow picks up on that willingness to help, and they feel more vitality, they feel more positive affect, and they feel higher self-esteem. Any of you have been helped by somebody who's unwilling to help you know exactly what I'm talking about here. <laughs> it doesn't make you feel better about yourself when someone resentfully helps you on any level of resentment. So again, it's the willing giving that we do for other people that really has the positive impact on them, independent of even how we're helping them. So while I'm, while I'm on odd topics in SDT, um, I want to move to this one too because our whole theory says that when people have their basic needs fulfilled, then they have wellness. They will be growing, they will be learning, they will be connecting with other people. In other words, that having basic needs met satisfies you in such a way as you continue to grow and to thrive. Well, if that's the case, then we then reason that some life goals, some of the dreams that people are chasing are more likely to actually satisfy their basic psychological needs than others. We live in a society that's giving us all kinds of goals. We heard this morning a lot about how achievement goals are so important in our culture. We're told, achieve, 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 achieve. But maybe achievement won't get you your basic needs met. Maybe it's something else. We're told, make money, so people get the message, make money, make money, make money. But what if in making money, you miss out on your basic psychological needs. So we think life goals make a difference in terms of need satisfaction. And um, I want to say here, our simple model is that some life goals will produce more wellness because they inherently will satisfy more of your basic psychological needs than others. Now, we in part derive our 
thinking about this from a very ancient tradition called the eudaimonic tradition. I've been writing a lot with uh, philosopher Randy Curran on this topic. I'm, I deeply love Aristotle's work in this regard. Uh, he made some empirically testable claims. First, he, he thought that uh, happiness was about living well. So when he used the term eudaimonia, sometimes translated as happiness, it's better translated as living well, a flourishing life. And he thought that what is that flourishing life, what's, what's the most satisfying way to live is the virtuous exercise of human potentialities, of doing the things that we find most intrinsically valuable. That's what he thought. And this is an empirical question because he could be wrong on this. He said that people are happy are those who've cultivated their character and their mind and they've kept the acquisition of external goods within moderate limits. And the people who are unhappy are those who've managed to acquire more external goods than they can possibly use and they're lacking of goods of the soul. Now this la bottom phrase could describe huge segments of our society. We have more material goods than we know what to do with but we could be lacking in the goods of the soul. So this is Aristotle's claim. And again, I say it's an empirical idea because maybe it's the people who acquire the most money who are happy. Because some modern philosophers disagree with Aristotle on this, and, and the major philosopher in disagreement with him is this guy. <laughs> and he's prolific. Uh, I only put up a portion of his books uh, up there. He wrote more than Aristotle, actually, more words than Aristotle, <laughs> at least that we know of. And you can see he has a very different uh, philosophy. Think big and kick ass. That doesn't sound either relatedness or autonomy supportive. Uh, but he wants you to be rich and, uh, and presumably a way to happiness. Um, his cultural message is not alone, however. Um, there's lots of data out on this. This is a Pew Foundation uh, survey that uh, I would reference here is that people can, you know, we, we have come as a society to believe you can purchase happiness. Uh, that it's important to work and consume and that we're mostly successful if we have money, the right image, if we're famous, those kinds of issues. So who's right? <laughs> I would point out that among these two formidable philosophers, they share one thing, which is a hairstyle. <laughs> Even back then, Aristotle needed some advice. And, uh, <laughs> so we can, we can ask who's right here. And so we started to explore this question within self-determination theory. And here, really, I thank uh, Tim Kasser, who was at one time a graduate student of mine who launched us on this work. And he's written some wonderful books, uh, uh, like uh, The Cost of Materialism and some other books like that, that uh, you might, his name is Tim Kasser, uh, really. A, and he's got, one of his books is a, a very accessible, good seller on, uh, I think it's called The High Price of Materialism. Anyway, uh, he, when he and I started working together, we reasoned that some goals in life, some life goals, might be more conducive to basic psychological needs and satisfaction, and some less so. And so we started to take a look at different goals, and we, and we uh, coded some as what we called intrinsic goals, that, that we thought these would pretty directly yield basic need satisfaction. So for instance, having the goal of intimate relationships in your life means you're more likely to form good relationships, you're more likely to get related to satisfaction. Uh, on the other hand, if your goal is being rich, then maybe what you would do is do most anything to get money so you might compromise your autonomy or you might give up some relationships in order to pursue that goal. Even if you get it, we think, well, uh, maybe you won't get the outcomes you need. At best, being rich indirectly gets you admiration. We think it hardly ever gets you love. So we started to study these things and we find out that they cohere together. This is just one of our random adult samples from a uh, um, we went door to door in uh, neighborhoods in the city of Rochester collecting this data. And we find that people who are interested in personal growth are also interested in intimate relationships, are also endorsing giving to their communities, also endorse physical health. These things hang together as a factor. People who want to be famous also want to be rich and they also want to have a cool image. And so those tend to hang together as two sets of values that mo all of us have uh, to some extent each of these in our uh, profiles. But we ask people, how important are those values? And then we look at how relatively they are important within person. So we take out the mean of all values, so we get a relative importance score. And you can see how this relates to outcomes in people's lives. Among these urban adults that we sampled, this is just a, one of the many, many samples we've had, uh, you can see that people who are more valuing of extrinsic goals, the people who are after money, fame, and image, are just more unhappy. They have more physical symptoms. They report more headaches, more stomach aches, more common uh, muscle pains and ailments, things that we think of as symptoms of stress. 
Uh, they report to higher levels of depression and much lower levels of energy and vitality, which is one of our most sensitive variables. And using a Maslowian measure here, a uh, measure of self-actualization, they're lower on this. And the opposite is true of people who are putting their money into, I mean, putting their investment into community relationships. And um, yes? No, this is why we look at the relative strength within person, uh, but they tend to be poorly correlated with one another, ne you know, either non-correlated or negative. Could be high in both. You could be high in both, yeah. yeah. And I think that's really important. That's why we look at the relative strength of this. So the worst configuration would be from an uh, intrinsic point of view, high, uh, low intrinsic, high uh, extrinsic. So this pattern of negative mental health effects, we've then seen, well, maybe that was just in our own uh, USA, but we've actually taken it around the world. And it's been replicated now in many, many samples around the world. So as you list some of the countries here, even Canadians show the same uh, <laughs> pattern. So we always think if we can get Canadians to do it, then it really is cross-culturally generalizable. <laughs> But not only that, we've looked at this in teenagers. That's really where we started this work. In fact, I do workshops on materialism with teenagers about uh, how to not get so trapped in it. Uh, but also parents, we've done parent groups with the same model. Uh, adult workers and retired workers. In fact, I'll show you some uh, retirement data in a minute on this. Uh, and some people said, well, it would be really uh, important to have extrinsic values be very important if you were in business school. So business school people won't show the same pattern. But in fact, we tested it in business schools and they show the same pattern of effects. If you're a business student and your primary goals are money, fame, uh, then you are still going to show these negative mental health effects. It's not about context, it's about basic needs. We even looked at this longitudinally. Recently we had a sample that came from Rochester that uh, was people who graduated and we contacted them one year after they finished college. Um, so they're now out into their careers and we had asked them before they left, what are your aspirations in life? And we coded them into intrinsic and extrinsic aspirations. And we find, first of all, that people when they left, then we follow them for two years. So this is one year post-college to, to three years out post-college. So we're following them during this important period of their goal formation in life. And this is the pattern that emerged. It's basically a pattern of you get what you ask for. So these are all students who've come through a major university, they've graduated, so they can get what they want. Those who are after uh, extrinsic aspirations, who wanted to make more money, who wanted to become more famous or have a cooler image, you can see they get that, in that over that longitudinal period of time. They actually attain that, but what they attain along with that is no increase in well-being and some increase in symptoms of ill-being. Now people who, uh, put their weight on intrinsic aspirations also attain those. Those who were after relationships or who wanted to give to the community tended to attain those outcomes. And what happened for them is their well-being increased as a function of that attainment and there was a negative relationship to ill-being. So in this longitudinal study we show the causal effect of your having adopted these goals on subsequent wellness. It's not just my data that shows this. This is data from, I think it was mentioned this morning, the world's largest Gallup poll study of happiness that was done by Ed Diener. And I, the reason I'm showing the study is because when Ed first collected the study, I think it was back in 2011, he wrote me a note when they were first analyzing the result. He said, I think you're going to like the results of this survey. They're certainly surprising. And what he's looking at is the sources every day of positive affect and negative affect in all these countries around the globe. And we see that you know, if you have a, a higher income, you're slightly happier. I have more positive affect and somewhat more less negative affect. If you make more money than your neighbors, that's associated with a small amount of positive affect and less negative. If you live in a wealthier nation, that has some positive effects. If your basic needs are unmet, and here this means food, medicine, shelter, other goods about physical needs, now we get a little bit stronger here, minus 16. Uh, with positive affect and 19 with negative affect and basic psychological needs, the thing we've been talking about here all day. Look at the beta on that. That's the biggest effect size of all. The most important predictor, therefore, worldwide of positive and negative affect is whether we're getting our autonomy, competence, and relatedness needs satisfied. And not so much whether we've attained physical outcomes. So this is even about attainment rather than valuing. Now, this is a cultural issue for all of us. And I show some data here by uh, Jeannie Twang, who uh, collected this data with her colleagues. 
and they were looking at the MMPI entrance scores for students entering college across the past 80 years or 70 years because we happen to have scores on all of that and when they correct the scores for the changes in the test MMPI is a personality test that uh, a lot of college university students take before they enter college so we have large samples across all these decades of this, it's the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. Oh, it's amazing I can remember that. Um, <laughs> uh, so taking that data, they're looking at the mental health scores of people entering college and you see a trend in the United States samples here of more psychopathology over time. Our cohorts, our entering college classes have more psychopathology than they used to. Here I show the lines for depression, there's increased rates of depression and cre increased rates of antisocial attitudes and behaviors. Uh, there were other findings, I just put these two up there. And they went through looking at every possible trend they could use to account for this. So they looked at changes in family patterns, changes in religious affiliation, changes in socioeconomic status, looking at ups and downs in the economy, and none of those accounted for this trend. But it happened, they had some values, uh, measures that are associated with the MMPI that they looked at, and they said the pattern of change best fits a cultural model toward extrinsic rather than intrinsic goals that may have negatively impacted uh, youth mental health. Over time, American culture has increasingly shifted to an environment with more and more young people experience poor mental health and psychopathology, possibly due to an increased focus on money, appearance, and status, rather than on community and relationships. Even Retired people, this is a study of people who have retired and the mean age in this sample was about 80. This is a Belgian sample collected by my uh, colleague Martin van Stinkisch, who we call Stinky because it's easier for us. Uh, he, what he did here is he asked people, what have you attained in your life? And he looked at their extrinsic attainments and their intrinsic attainments and then he correlated that with their current well-being. So in this population you see the people who felt that they have attained in their intrinsic goals in life have higher well-being lower depression, higher ego integrity, less despair, and they're more accepting of death. And you see the people who've attained extrinsic goals, this isn't providing them that protection at this point in time. They still have some business to finish here in life. So all across the lifespan, this matters, all the way from teenage years, all the way up through now. And the reason I mention this is because, first of all, I wanted to settle the debate. And I think it's settled here. I think Aristotle empirically wins out on this. But also because everybody in this room is interested in adult development and its facilitation, we should think about development toward what? What are we helping people succeed at? What are the goals that we're choosing and why do we have those goals? We should always be reflecting on those things. If, I, if I'm after more money, why? For what? What's my end game in there? And if it's not ultimately leading to the betterment of my own psychological needs or those of the people I love, then I question, what's it about? What's the money for? So I want to move off that discussion um, and now just talk a little bit about interventions. And I want to do so quickly because I would like to just open up the floor to questions um, of all sorts. So in this discussion, I want to talk about facilitating some issues and I said before that if we want to increase people's wellness, if we want to increase their productivity and their motivation, we facilitate their basic psychological needs. And I want to spend a little time on this. So what do we do to support autonomy? What do our interventions do? What do we do as clinicians and as coaches? I always say that the most important thing we can do in supporting somebody else's autonomy is to take their frame of reference as a starting point for understanding what's going on. So we have to get inside the other person's perspective. Everything begins with empathy. So as a clinician, if I want to help another person, the first thing I have to do is know what, how they're viewing the world around them. And that means I have to let go of my own presumptions, my own values, my own ways of doing things to hear the worldview of somebody else and what it is within their worldview that they're trying to actualize. This is not an easy thing to do all the time. And I, I'm just going to give one case example of this. I was referred somebody who was a mandated referral to me who was, who was referred to me because he had been abusive to his wife, physically abusive to his wife. He had hit her pretty hard and pretty nastily. I have very strong feelings about such things just because of my own background and other issues. Uh, it's a soft spot for me. So when he was referred to me, I said, I don't want this case. 
because I already felt prejudices and uh, upset about the case itself. But it turned out for many reasons I needed to take the case. First of all, everyone else refused more than me, <laughs> harder than me. Uh, secondly, my interjects as a clinician said, oh, you should do this. <laughs> and then I also thought, maybe this would be interesting. Maybe there's something I could learn from going against the grain of my own feeling here. So I had to work hard before this man came in to see me just to clear my own plate of my own already existing presumptions and prejudices against him. And so when he came in, I said, you know, I understand that you were mandated to come here. Tell me how you see that. And he, he said, yeah, I, w I was mandated to come here. I deserved it. And then I said, uh, say more about that. And he said, well, I don't know about deserving it, but I, I do want to be here. I need to make some changes. And then he went through a story about his own life, about the abuse he suffered, about his own uh, situation of stress and his own relationship with his wife and the, the, its history. And by the time he was finished with the story, I'm not saying I could ever endorse what he did, but I could understand the man from which it came. And he could see that he was also understood. And he, he even said to me at the end of that first meeting, this is one of the first times I've been able to talk with somebody without them uh, telling me I need to change. You haven't said that to me once. I said, well, you started by saying you wanted that. I, I'm taking that as a given here. And then we proceeded to have a really productive set of meetings subsequently. As it turns out, he divorced his wife. Uh, that was already in the works. Uh, he has never found relationships since then easy, and I ran into him recently, so it was 10 years now after that uh, set of meetings, and it turns out he's a very happy, well-adjusted guy now. He no longer has any drug addiction problems, he no longer has any of those kinds of issues, and he works on a farm, and he said to me, the reason I really love farming is because I can help things grow. Think about the difference here with a man I was already starting to have prejudice against by entering into his worldview, by sharing empathically in it, we're at a starting point for actual change. So I can't say enough about the first thing that autonomy support always begins with empathy. And then it always encourages self-reflection and self-initiation. You know, this morning Bob talked a lot about these small experiments that he sets up for people. I think those are really great because it's a little bit of initiation and you're supporting that initiation. And I also think being reflective. Why are we doing the things we're doing? And how is it really going as we evaluate those things? And then to share in that person's reflection, not my reflection on what they're doing, but how they're reflecting on it. So again, it's not so important how I view somebody's experience. It's important that they they're able to tell me theirs. That's the crucial thing. When we're supporting autonomy, we're trying to give people as much choice as possible, but choice gets misinterpreted a lot. Choice sometimes means decisions between alternatives, all of which are meaningless. This is not choice as we mean it. When we mean choice, we mean that somebody's able to find an alternative that they can truly endorse or stand behind. That's a meaningful choice. So if I'm raising my children and I say, well, you've got a choice here. You can either take out the garbage or you can go to your room. That's not a meaningful choice. <laughs> a meaningful choice is I see you're resistant to taking out the garbage. There are alternative chores you could do here, but one of them will be yours. And I'm, you know, I understand that these are not things you want to do, but we're all taking responsibility here now. So, but you get to choose which of these tasks. If the garbage is the one that you really resent, then mowing the lawn, that's another alternative or whatever it is. Then we're in a different dialogue now. So meaningful choice means where you have to insist on something, you try and provide as much choice as possible. And if you do have to set a limit on behavior, uh, that you do so by doing it empathically, by understanding that there is resistance, again, by offering choices where you can, and by all means, you should have a rationale. And why is a rationale important? If I'm trying to get somebody else to volitionally do something, they have to have a reason. If they don't have a good reason for doing it, they can't volitionally do it. They can do it by my authority, or they can do it by their own interjects or other uh, controlling reasons, but they can only do it autonomously if they know why they're doing it. So rationale, again, is one of these very cheap motivational devices which we often forego in our leadership roles, is telling people why. So it's a big difference if I have a grant deadline coming up and I go to my team and I say, here's the deadline of the grant we're competing for and here's the things we'd have to get done. What do you think about that? Do you think it's realistic? And can we make it happen? Now we're all on board with the reasons for the pressure. We know the deadline. We're sharing the deadline. And we're all on task together. And if somebody has some strong objections like, no, I can't do that within this, we hear it then. And it's, it's heard as a real thing. That's, in part, 
now we have a reason and we're all on board with the same thing. The other alternatives I can go in and say, uh, our deadline is uh, October 30th and uh, we have better have it done. That's the controlling way. There's no rationale. You just do what I tell you to do. And you cannot experience autonomy in that situation. So these are all ways of uh, maximizing autonomy. And then also to maximize autonomy, we minimize the use of controlling rewards and the use of uh, controlling language, shoulds, must, have tos. And we much more focus on uh, how can we bring some energy toward this and how can uh, people's choices move in these directions. I'm going to say more about rewards and other issues as we go on, but I just want to give a brief overview of, of what supportive environments look like. Competence support is where you design activities to be dominantly a mastery experience. Again, flow theory, I think, has taken us off course on this. I think the truth is people mostly like to feel successful at what they do, and they're most motivated when they can. We like to run into occasional optimal challenges where we're right on the edge of our skills and ability and we're in that middle of that flow map. But if we're there too much of the time, we won't want to go back to that domain. That's what the data really shows. So we want periodic moments of flow, but we don't want that to be our dominant experience. We mostly want success to be the dominant experience. And if you don't believe me, look at what video game developers have done. The reason they have such engaging games and why so many people are addicted to those games is that they know that you mostly want to have successful experiences. They set up a few tough challenges within games, but they mostly allow you to succeed and give you the tools to succeed so that people love that. Even Angry Birds, which many people in this room have probably played, you know that the experience of competence is built up really slowly in that game and it, uh, it's mostly all positive feedback of pretty easy stuff to do. And that's why people persist at it. If it was always on the edge of the hardest problem that you could do, you would not like that game. Structure is a hugely important thing. So I want to separate two ideas that get confused in people's minds, structure and control. So when I provide structure for people, I'm giving them the tools that they need to know how to succeed at doing something. So we're teaching them the rules of the game, some strategies that might be working for them, some guideposts that they should be watching out for. All of these things would be structure in a work environment. So you can provide structure by saying, you know, here's the guidepost to watch out for, here are strategies that have worked for others. Or you can say, here's my structure, here's the strategy you're going to use, and here's the guidepost you better watch for. In other words, structure can be introduced controllingly or it can be introduced in an autonomy supportive way. Structure is not inherently controlling. In fact, it's helpful to competence. As, I'm, as, as we're raising children, we want to provide them with the tools and the ideas and the, uh, the mechanisms for how to succeed at the various things that they do. I taught my kids all kinds of soccer moves. I taught my kids all kinds of uh, academic tricks that they could use in school as ways of advancing their feelings of competence. I didn't do it controllingly to say, you must do these things to get better at this. I said, here's some ways that uh, I saw worked. You can give these a try. It's a choice, but it's also structure. Feedback, when you're giving people feedback, we say it's informational rather than controlling. The purpose of feedback is always should be in the advocacy and the support of the person to whom you're giving feedback. Feedback should be to help them progress. So it should be efficacy oriented. So if you have to give negative feedback about how something didn't work, it's done so that they can do it right the next time. It has to include in it the information that will be helpful to move ahead, not just the information about what has gone wrong. And I submit to you again, if we look at our schools, our motivation devices in schools, we, we put grades on tests with no information. We tell people how they rank ordered against the others, but nothing about how you could do better. And it's no wonder that so many of our children would draw effort from school under those circumstances. Because why put your ego on the line if you might fail anyway? So feedback should be, we say, informational because it's efficacy oriented. It's not about judgments and about comparisons. And so if you praise people, praise is always focused on specific accomplishments or efforts that they've done rather than ability comparisons or between person uh, comments. It's not how smart you are, it's how smart you were at that that's a better comment to be making. Finally, when we think about relatedness supports, relatedness supports in a context always convey respect for the individuals who are members there. That means that the person can feel valued and significant. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to give you all these slides. I should have announced that earlier, that, uh, that actually they're going to be emailed to everybody that's in this room, I think, automatically. Isn't that correct? We'll find a way. Yeah, we're going to find a way. Uh, I should have mentioned that earlier, because I just saw somebody taking notes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
I didn't provide enough structure here to begin with. <laughs> yeah, but we like the spontaneity. Thank you. <laughs> so the individual feels valued and significant. And again, this can take place in a pretty easy way. I mentioned this morning this, uh, this item that we use sometimes, my boss likes me. It's pretty easy to convey that people are significant and valued because you care that they showed up for work. You're positive about their presence that's there. Uh, when you don't feel that, you also don't feel as motivated. You really, it's, it's a hard thing to be in a workplace where you don't feel like you're a valued member of a team or where you don't feel like the people who are above you or next to you really like you. And I showed this this morning. This was, a, this was the Wall Street Broker study, so I'm going to skip over this one and say there's lots of other examples of this. One of the first ones we went into was a shoe factory because after doing Wall Street Brokers, we thought we really need a different sample here. <laughs> so we went to a shoe factory, and this is Barbara Lardy uh, led this uh, study. And uh, in the shoe factory, of course, most of the people who were there were line workers. They were the people who stapled together the various parts of the shoes. And then some were managers there. But you, so you would think, well, there's not a lot of autonomy support there. But the shoe factory workers had a lot of things to say about autonomy, about how they could decide upon breaks or no breaks, about how they went about their work, about various inputs on their job of whether they could change stations or not change stations. So they had a lot of things over which they would like a voice and choice. And if those, those whose managers allowed them to experience that were much more motivated workers. We did a work, uh, this is just another example of a hospital staff recently where uh, there was a lot of changes that were put into the programs, uh, presumably for the protection of patients, but it was actually pretty burdensome to staff in some ways. Uh, so uh, the uh, rationale had to be explained, uh, and there was a lot of work to try and help this initiative go through the hospital to ensure buy-in. And the people who really felt that their autonomy was supported during this transition were the people who really bought in. If they felt it was pushed on them, then they didn't buy in and they were less compliant with the program overall. Even in a communist atmosphere, and this was a study we did way back when uh, it was finally published in 2001, but it was actually done in 1989. And in 1989, we happened to be in Bulgaria. We were invited there by the ministries of labor and education to talk about motivation to some of their people. And then a revolution happened uh, over that time. And it screwed up our study design pretty bad. We wanted them to stay communist because we were studying a communist country. <laughs> but they didn't. Uh, uh, and in kind of an odd uh, circumstance, uh, we were being funded by the communist government there. And so we turned around to the US government. We said, well, could we study the transition out of communism? And they gave us a grant to do that. Uh, so <laughs> uh, uh, interestingly, they gave us the grant in a very odd way. They called at the end of the budgetary period. And they said they had a little money left over. And they wanted something wild and crazy. And they thought of us. <laughs> So anyway, they did fund us after all. So we studied uh, people who were in state-owned factories in Bulgaria. And we find that they, this, uh, we had to collapse across the two samples because they were the same. But autonomy support, even in a communist factory, uh, made a difference in the work lives of people. In fact, they rated their managers as more autonomy supportive than the banking population we were comparing them with here in the US. And they had, the, the banking population felt more competence needs satisfaction and lower support of autonomy. And the people working in state-owned factories felt no competence satisfactions at all because nothing they did made a difference. But they felt a lot of autonomy support in their job. So each came to um, outcomes in a different way. This was a Fortune 500 company in which uh, at DC, Jim Connell and I did a, a major intervention study. And this was the baseline data that got them to allow us to do the intervention. I think at this point I can mention the company because it's Xerox Corporation, which used to be very, very big in Rochester. And we're not responsible for the fact that they've collapsed. It's not, <laughs> it was really not our intervention. Uh, at this time, they were, they were big. And, but they were doing a lot of layoffs. So this is in the context of a lot of that. Uh, what they saw was that uh, we were working with the people who were called customer service representatives. Those are the people who fix Xerox machines. And at that time, there were 12,000 of them in the country. And if you looked at ratings of their managers and their uh, own job satisfaction, manager autonomy support was predictive of all kinds of job satisfaction ratings, including the ones that you see here. So general satisfaction with job, 0.69 related to how autonomy supported their immediate manager was. So the company said, well, this is pretty important. We should do an intervention with them. And so we did an intervention. Um, it was not a very intensive intervention because uh, the, it was experimental. Uh, the, uh, the top manager in every district, so there were multiple districts around the country, was met with for one day only. Uh, then the management team, the sub-managers within those branches were met with. And uh, that was a little more intensive. That was five days over three months of uh, really half-day workshops. Uh, 
and then one group meeting that we went to with each of the managers to look at the, how they managed that and gave feedback on the group. So not a very intensive intervention, but it worked. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, experimental group increased in autonomy support, whereas the control group uh, actually uh, non-significantly went down. This is during a time of lots of turnover there. So the intervention worked, but the company said, we don't want you to measure the outcomes. We want to do that ourselves. We're going to have our own corporate team measure outcomes because, you know, you're researchers, we might not believe you. <laughs> uh, so this is what they found. So they found that uh, after our intervention, those people who were in the intervention branches increased in their trust in the company. They increased in their own job satisfaction, and they were increasing their satisfaction with their current pay and benefits. You can think about that the opposite side. If I have a controlling manager or boss, so I don't like work, I damn well think you should pay me more. Because I want more money for what I'm doing here, because I'm not enjoying it intrinsically. So this last thing uh, the company was particularly interested in, because they were pretty highly paid workers, even though they were not all uh, highly motivated. Now why did employee trust in the corporation go up. When you have a controlling manager, controlling managers tend to do the following thing, which is they say, you need to do this now. And that's because they're telling me to do it. They point upwards. And when they point upwards, that's decreasing trust in the corporation. Autonomy supportive managers are trying to give a rationale and they're trying to give a, a transformational message of why to get on board with the program so they don't displace that trust, uh, mistrust higher up. I'm going to skip a couple things here. I just want to say we often create our own self-fulfilling prophecy. So there are many stories I could tell you about this, but uh, oftentimes if you talk with a controlling manager or a controlling teacher, they'll say, well, the people I work with, you have to control them or else they will not be motivated. And I actually believe them. I believe them because I think you create that atmosphere around yourselves. I'm just going to tell you one quick story on this. We, uh, we had this belief, and so we thought, well, we could test this in elementary school classrooms. So we picked out a group of teachers who were extreme on a controlling score, and we picked out a, a group that was extreme on an autonomy supportive score. And then we, did some, we asked the school, can we send in a substitute teacher during first period of class? And the reason for this was we thought, well, if you were with a controlling teacher, you might behave in front of her or him, but when the substitute teacher comes in, you've internalized nothing, so all hell should break loose. And if you're an autonomy supportive teacher, you've helped the children internalize values for demeanor and behavior in classroom, and they'll likely behave for a new person who comes in. So we invented this study, and one of my former students, Wendy Grolnick, who's now a popular author of parenting books, or an author of popular parenting books, she's both those things, um, she, uh, she was the person we picked to be the substitute teacher because she looked like a classic ineffectual substitute teacher. <laughs> I don't think she'd object to me saying that. She's actually a quite powerful and uh, authoritative woman, but she doesn't look that way from the outside. So we sent her in. And our experiment was so successful, we could never finish it. Because what happened is in the controlling teachers' classrooms, the children did start to misbehave so badly that we had to exert kinds of controls that frustrated our experimental design. So. The notion is we create the climates around us. We create a self-fulfilling prophecy. If I'm controlling with my workers all the time, the only thing they respond to is control. If I teach my students that the whip and the carrot is how we work, if the whip and the carrot are not out, there's no motivation in place. And so those people are right, which is that until I pull out the carrot or the stick, they don't move. That's true. But you created that atmosphere. And so we have to think about that too. I just want to talk about rewards. I put this up before about how rewards are a complicated affair. And I just want to say a couple of things about rewards. Not all rewards are bad. I like rewards myself. I like getting paid for the things I do. I'm not against bonuses if they're properly constructed. What happens with rewards is that they're used to control. If I want an outcome, I take out a bigger reward or I threaten a bigger sanction. And I think that's the way to motivate people to do it. And that's a controlling way of using rewards. And that's what undermines. And there are many, many issues with this. But what are some of the issues with this? Well, the first thing is that if I'm using a reward to get you to do something else, I'm inherently and automatically devaluing the thing itself. If I tell my children, for every book you read, I'll give you a pizza, what I'm doing is telling them that pizzas are cool and books aren't so cool. That's why you've got to do the one to get the other. So Pizza Hut had a big program like this, the Books for Pizza thing, where schools participated in this. And what schools found is that this was a, a way to, uh, um, in a way, get kids to misreport how many books they'd read. 
uh, because it was how many you reported having read, and if you read the dust cover, maybe you could get by with that. How many short books you could find, because it wasn't done. <laughs> this is what happens with all outcome-focused reward systems. You find the shortest route to the end, including cheating, and then if that gets reinforced, then you do more of it. So what the Pizza Hut reading program did is it did a great job of advertising Pizza Hut, and it made a lot of kids value pizza. But it didn't make them value books more. If we were going to do a program that would value books, we would say, every, every time you eat a pizza, we'll give you a book. <laughs> that would have been a cool program. <laughs> If I, if I take out the carrot and the stick when I run into a motivational problem, I have a person who's not doing what I hope that they would be doing at work, and I say, okay, I'm going to solve that problem. I'll put out a sanction or reward for doing it. What I'm trying to do is overpower the problem without diagnosing it. If I have somebody who's having a problem at work and I say, if you don't do this, you won't get the bonus at the end of the year, I still haven't found out what the problem is at work. I've only put more pressure on them. Oftentimes, we just don't diagnose the problem. This often happens in schools, too, where uh, teachers take out bigger and bigger rewards and punishments on a kid who has something else going on that's preventing them from working. And all this is doing is alienating that child all the more. And I told the story this morning to somebody about one of these presumably hopeless kids that I was asked to intervene with. And in the first conversation we had, I said, well, so how come you hate, dislike the classroom so much? What's going on in there that makes it so boring for you. He said, well, you ne I never know what's going on. It's always so confusing the way the information is presented. You can't even see what she writes on the board. So you can't even see that? What do you mean? I can't see it. He, had, he needed glasses. No one had diagnosed this. No one had asked. No one had gone inside the internal frame of reference to find out where are the barriers in this child. And that's the simplest one. Suppose it's that they haven't eaten. Suppose it's that somebody uh, in my school district, which is one of the poorest in the country, maybe somebody's been shot that they know. Uh, it's, uh, there's unbelievable things that are barriers that they're being brought in. And rewards and punishments won't overpower them. So if you're trying to solve a motivational problem, diagnosis is the most important thing. And you get there from the inside, not from the outside. When we reward other people and we do it publicly, we're then demotivating all the others automatically. And I ask you to watch an award ceremony at a school where the high achievers and their parents all get up on stage and they're all proud and happy. And I'm not saying that that's a good strategy for them, but the interesting thing is to look at the people in the audience whose kids are not getting awards and are not. Is this adding to their motivation? I think not. It's leading to more withdrawal of motivation, and that's what the evidence says. Contingent rewards where only a few people get them actually decrease motivation uh, for everybody. When you use rewards and punishments to motivate, and rewards in particular, you get what we call the motivational spillover effect. And again, I'm going to give a simple example of that. Um, I have a, a, a student at, in my team. Uh, we're working on a project together, and I say, if, you, uh, if you'll also do the analysis on project B, I'll give you some money for doing that, too. So we do that, and then project C comes up, and it's like, so could you do some analyses on that? And it's like, well, how much more money do I get? Because I set the expectation with these other things. Now they see that they're doing this job for money rather than what they used to be doing it for, which was finding out the answers. If I say to my child at home, uh, if you take out the garbage, I will pay you X amount of dollars. This is, I guess, a way of trying to get them to be responsible, but it's not really responsible. It's a way of controlling their garbage taking out behavior. But what happens for that is now the, in my home in Rochester, it snows and the driveway needs to be shoveled. I say, so we, we have to go shovel the driveway. It's like how much I'm getting paid for it. This is motivational spillover. We set a model and it starts to spill over to the other things that we would hope would be done for other reasons. And finally, outcome-focused rewards. I'm not going to, we can go on and on with the nuances around rewards. This is very complicated territory. But we, we have a thing that we call the Enron effect that happens because of outcome-focused rewards. So when we give people rewards for outcomes rather than for specific behaviors, uh, we're doing something that even B.F. Skinner would not endorse. B.F. Skinner would roll over in his grave if he saw what we were doing with high stakes testing or we were doing with stock market bonuses for CEOs. Because there you were rewarding an outcome, and that means you're reinforcing any means possible to that outcome. And so if we give people bonuses for increasing the stock price over short quarterly periods, they can do all kinds of things that are bad for companies and bad for employees to increase their own bonuses and to get equally reinforced with things that are company strengthening. If we give teachers bonuses or threaten sanctions for not increasing test scores, we reinforce any route to that end, which means teaching to the test. Even the 
cheating that we've seen going on all over the nation. These are things that are being reinforced, bad practice in classrooms because of outcome-focused rewards. Outcome-focused rewards reinforce any route to the end, and that makes them a destructive force in companies and in education, and we should not be using them, ever. I can see no circumstance under which they're a positive effect. Um, finally, if you use rewards and punishments as your way of doing things, you've got to monitor everybody all the time. That's part of the problem of these kinds of evaluative systems is that they require constant monitoring because people will try and game your system and they typically can outdo us no matter how it's designed. So I just want to summarize a little bit about this. All managerial functions can be thought about in terms of whether they're need satisfying or need thwarting. Every element of being a manager from the way you use the rewards to the way you provide structure to the way you greet people as they come in the door can be thought of in terms of its impact on need satisfaction. And that's the way we think about management. I'm going on a lot longer than I wanted to. I was going to talk about this in schools because I do a lot of work in schools on how leadership affects teachers and their burnout. And the thing I only really wanted to say about that is when we're really controlling with teachers, it rolls downhill. They become more controlling with students. That's what the evidence shows here. This is evidence from Canada, but we've also had the same from Israel and the US, which is uh, this is a very blurry slide. At first, I thought it was my glasses, but it's the slide that uh, teachers feel pressure from unmotivated students, and they also feel pressure on high stakes testing from above and from principals who are anchored in that, and that lowers their self-determination at work, and when their self-determination is lower, they're more controlling in their classroom practices. And so this is an irradiating effect. Um, I do lots of work in healthcare, but I'm gonna, I'm, I want more time for questions and answers, so I'm gonna just go to uh, some interventions that we've done in healthcare quickly. When you want people to change, that's our dangerous position to be in. If you think you already know the direction they should go, we think this is a problem in control. So when we do healthcare interventions, we think we don't know where people need to go. We start with the assumption that there is no goal that we have preordained. This is so important to what being autonomy supportive is about. So even something like smoking cessation, when we started on some smoking cessation work, we did not make our goal to get people to quit smoking. Our goal was to get people to make a really choiceful decision. That was our clinical endpoint. If the clinical endpoint is that they really autonomously make a decision, we think the outcomes will be good because most people will decide in a direction of health and vitality for themselves rather than a direction to stay doing something they already know is harmful. They don't need us to tell them so. Almost every, uh, every smoker I've ever talked to knows how harmful it is. They may not know the specifics of it, but everyone knows how it is. So they don't need to be told they should stop. What we need to have is a conversation about what's the barriers to doing so. So in our clinical intervention, we, and this is the very first one we did on smoking, we had 1,000 patients, and we tried to recruit the most unmotivated people. You know, you look at smoking cessation studies, they might have high rates, but you have to look at how many barriers they put people through, how much readiness they tested for, whether they were going for real smokers or the people who were already most of the way out the door. We were trying for what we call the thick part of the board. So we advertised on the uh, bus system in our county and the penny saver newspapers to get people to come in for a conversation about their health. Which would and we wanted smokers because, so we recruited smokers to come in and their commitment was that they would come in for two sessions to have this conversation and if they wanted any of our services, they could continue those services. So. Uh, six in ten of the people who came in had no intention of quitting at all, meaning they said no to any decision to change, uh, and they were a, a poor group. So, um, here's my slide here. So when we did the intervention again, the idea was to help them facilitate a clear choice. And when you do that in a really non-controlling way, people are willing to talk to you. So if you're really not in the position, so one of the things that we would typically ask right at the beginning of interviews is, well, you know, since you've been a smoker for a long time, it must get you a lot of cool things. What's, what's good about smoking? What, where does it help you? How is it important in your life? Without knowing these things, we wouldn't know what the barriers are to changing. People use smoking for lots of things, like emotion regulation. People who are in jobs where they have a lot of reason to be angry are smoking to let off steam so they can walk outside. Some people are just really anchored into it for emotion regulation reasons, other because it's just a, a strong habit. Everybody has their own stuff going on around this. But if we start from the standpoint of autonomy support, people want to change. And of course, this first clinical trial was a quite successful clinical trial. Uh, autonomy, of course, predicted both adherence to nicotine replacement medications as well as 
uh, an interest in gaining skills and competencies, which was a second route to cessation. We're now on our, this was a successful trial. It was uh, uh, followed up for three years, but we've now done three subsequent clinical trials, adding new elements each time, with the old ones being our, our comparison group. So we're really refining these methods. But I really wanted to make the point, you don't try and make people change. You try and help people find the change they'd like to make. Um, so as I said before, we've been doing a lot of these interventions and all those things on the right are the, uh, are the places where we had actual control clinical trials. I'm a psychotherapist and I kind of want to then speak a bit about this because it's very close to the work that you do. Uh, I think of myself as somebody who's trying to advance development and pick it up where it has been stalled or regressed in the past as, as a big part of my work. There's lots of uh, different approaches to treatment, but all clinicians are faced with the task of motivation. I wrote an article on this recently, which is different theories of change have different theories of motivation embedded within them. Some theories say, well, you can do my change, but you have to be ready first. So they measure readiness, and if you're ready, then they take you into the treatment. And they may show a high rate of success, but you have to count the people that they didn't count as ready, and then those are very high attrition rates if those are actually counted in. Other treatments say if there's a motivation problem, that's part of treatment itself. So when people come to me, for instance, my own orientation as a psychotherapist is if somebody's blocked or resistant, I don't think of that as a lack of readiness. I think of that as the problem to deal with now. That's what we should be addressing and, and getting on the internal frame. What's the resistance about? Let me empathize with it. So we can be autonomy supportive or we can be controlling in any treatment, though, that we deliver. It can be done in ways that say you should do it this way or here's how it's done or in ways that are more choiceful and autonomy supportive. And this is a study that was done uh, at McGill University um, led by David Zurich and uh, Richard Kessner and others. And they were just looking at treatments for depression. And they were looking at how autonomy supportive the therapist was and different types of treatment were being used. One was interpersonal therapy. One was a cognitive behavioral treatment. One was a psychopharmacology treatment with clinical management. And what they looked at is the success of each of those treatments uh, as a function both of the treatment itself and how autonomy supportive the uh, therapist was. Over here on the right, you just see a graph that just basically says all of these treatments were successful. All three of them reduced uh, depression symptoms com uh, compared to the control groups. On the other hand, if you had an autonomy supportive uh, therapist delivering any of those treatments, your outcome success was twice as high as if you were just average and four times as high as if you were a controlling therapist. So this extra ingredient in aut was autonomy support in these therapies. And, that, and so Zuroff did an interesting thing. They also measured separately from autonomy support something we think is really part of it. They called it therapeutic alliance. But what the data showed is that while autonomy support predicts uh, therapeutic alliance, uh, the thing that's most predicting uh, autonomy support, of course, is, or, I mean, the autonomy of the patient is autonomy support itself. And in fact, in their outcome stuff, they showed that autonomy support was more important than therapeutic alliance in prediction of outcomes, which they've shown across a few things. Now, we think that they're intricately related to one another. They're never antithetical. They're mutually supportive. But to say that that's more important than this common factor ingredient that's been empirically identified is saying a lot. So when I think about my own work as a therapist, I, what do, am I doing? Well, I'm using SDT in part because I'm always trying to support the autonomy of my clients. I'm trying to take their frame of reference, trying to understand their goals, and trying to help them reach the things that they'd like to attain in their lives. I'm also fostering relatedness because I feel deeply connected to them, and the whole process of self-disclosure and sharing and support, I think, continually deepens that intimacy and that relationship. You, know, you can see that today in our case study, how deep that relationship is, how touched he is by his work with Carol. And we all get that benefit from our work together. So when people want to make a change and they've autonomously decided on the change, that's when competence issues can come in. That's when skill-based things can come in. But I always say, before we get to the skill-based things, we need to do the psychotherapy. We need to make sure that the goal is really congruent and autonomous before we start going and building skills on this. So at least in our one-two punch on therapy, we say, you know, first let's get clear on where we're going. And then once you've got that commitment to go there, then we can start doing skill-based things that will enhance your efficacy. And that, that's a lot about ex active experimentation. I was really interested to hear Bob's thing today because we encourage a lot of active experimentation where the failure is never a possibility because failure is always informative. 
So we, we want people to make changes, to try changes, see what works, see what doesn't work, come back and tell us where our advice was bad and wrong, uh, be really open and receptive to all of that because that's part of the process of learning. And we're learning together, it's a collaborative adventure. And the issue of basic psychological needs is their guideposts. I'm always listening for those because they always turn out to be the most salient things. Again, I think if you looked at that case study that we had this morning, the most salient things in the case study are issues of relatedness and issues of autonomy at work and to some extent issues of competence. These are always the barriers and the issues if you're listening deeply for it. People don't always quite know how to articulate that, so sometimes it's helpful to have these guideposts so you know where to go in your inquiry and conversation. So the implications for practice is that, you know, there are many, and I just laid a few of them here, when we want to support people's autonomy, we're listening, we're listening to their perspectives, we acknowledge their feelings, their resistances, their issues all the time. In fact, we prize all expressions of those, particularly the negative ones, because that's what we want to hear. We want people to tell us where we're not helpful. We invite that to happen, because that's where we find out the barriers and the issues. Um, we provide effective and meaningful options and choices, not just choices. And if there's a reason to change or a particular direction to change or we're giving advice, which sometimes happens in medical domains, we have a rationale. And we have a rationale that we explain as best as possible. So we can reflect on the nature of the intrinsic and extrinsic goals. But even in doing so, we have to remain non-judgmental because people have their own goals and we're trying to help them pursue them. And of course, as I spoke about this morning and didn't speak about here, mindfulness will facilitate all of this because we're aware and we're receptive and we're taking in the worldview of the other people whose world it is that we're trying to facilitate. So with that said, I think that was the end of what I wanted to say here in my preliminary talk. So I just want to open the floor to all questions and thank you very much. So thank you, Rich, um, and we've got a good, uh, still 3.45, so we've actually got um, 50 minutes. Yeah, it's very hard for me to and, talk. And we, to, just to switch gears, just let's just take 10 seconds and just breathe in and out, and just sort of let some of this sink in. Is there, is there water? Water. Could someone get Rich some water? Someone back there? Rich, I'd like to tie, uh, I know there are lots of questions, but I'm going to take the organizer's prerogative and just ask a couple to tie back into this morning's sure. conversation. Um, and um, so you mentioned oh, that, you. You. that um, the conversation about flow and stretching to the edge of your abilities and being challenged. Okay, so if you look at Barbara Fredrickson's work with resilience, her point is that if you have to have a certain level of positivity in order to hang, handle the negativity of life and the challenge in order to be resilient. And we know from Corey Key's study about in 2002 around flourishing that only 17.2% of us, obviously that's a number related to the study, but less than 20% of adults are flourishing. So I wonder if you were to just take flourishing people, would you have people wanting flow that's more challenging? Mm. And are you looking at a whole population where a lot of people don't have enough positivity to want to be in a challenging role more of the time? Did everybody hear this question? So, I think the question really is, uh, you know, I said some things about a flow not being the place where many people would like to be. They would like more the experience of dominant mastery with only occasional periods of flow. And the question was, if Corey Keyes is right, that only 17.2% of us are actually flourishing individuals, would that 17.2% be people who would like to spend more time in that optimal zone that Csikszentmihalyi uh, specifies within his flow theory? Yeah. I think the answer to that is no. Because I think, well, first of all, I don't know about the 17.2%. I think we're all flourishing to different degrees. And we're flourishing in different areas. But when we think about the con even the concept of what optimal challenge is, uh, it applies across the spectrum of competency and of, of achievement. So if I'm uh, 
you know, the, well, I'm not going to say me, but if we took the case of the man this morning who was obviously really competent in many spheres of life, even he would not want to sit at the edge of his competencies all the time. Right. In fact, he would like to have some many days at work where he just went in and he was uh, in control and knew what was going on in his environment and things were going fine. Most of us would like that with the occasional challenge. So it's not just about being at the top end. I think okay. it's true for all humans. Uh, that we want that. Now, I do want to say something uh, kind about flow while I'm also bashing some empirical basis for flow. Because <laughs> flow has come to mean many things to many people. It's, uh, you know, we have a map of what flow means in terms of optimal challenge, but it doesn't really relate at all to the discourse on flow in our literature. And part of this is because Mike Chiximahai is a great writer. And he's been able to take the concept of flow and apply it to everything in the world. But I'm talking about the narrower empirical conception of flow as it's based in uh, the prediction of skills, challenge, balances. That's the place where we don't always want to be sitting at that edge. Uh, do we want to be in a place where we feel absorbed and uh, uh, involved and engaged in what we're doing? If that's what we mean by flow, absolutely. And how do we get there? We get there because we feel need satisfaction ongoingly in what we're doing. Right. And then we have flow. So in fact, that's similar to intrinsic motivation, right? Right. That's, yeah, that's really right. what, OK. The second question in is. In fact, uh, intrinsic motivation and flow were really co-discovered around the same time, or at least not, I mean, intrinsic motivation really goes back to the 50s and animal experimentation in the 50s. But the books on flow and intrinsic motivation in humans really came out in 1975, around the same time, really covering some very similar turf. So right, they're closely yeah. related. The second question, if you look at the developmental stages, so we've got the stage when people, the socialized mind is more concerned about approval from one's tribe and, and, and less sort of going after one's destiny, and then you have self-authoring where you're really going after your destiny and asserting your place in the world, and then the higher level of self-transforming where you're simply um, a part of the co a cog in the system and evolving every day as the system around you evolves. Would, does this translate to each of those stages? Mm -hmm. I mean, is this so universal? The question is, is, is the trajectory that I, that's really loud, um, is the, is the um, map of autonomy that I put up, is that a developmental map? Or is that a map of motivation and a continuum? It is not a developmental map. So I want to say that as strongly as I can, it is not that you begin externally regulated and become interjected and become identified, become integrated, become, it's not that at all. You can start activities intrinsically, babies are intrinsically motivated to reach up and grab their, uh, their crib things. Uh, some children can have identifications right away when they emulate their parents uh, in ways that, uh, that make sense to them. So you can start with identifications and go backwards. You can start with external regulations and go forwards. When I'm doing psychotherapy, one thing I'm often doing is listening to people's interjects, the shoulds, the pressures they have. And in listening to that and discussing it, I don't know which way it's going to go. Maybe that interject will implode. They decide, really, I didn't want to be doing that all along. It's not my value. And they will let go of it and become amotivated with respect to that. Or they could say, no, you know, I've been interjected all along, but I really do want this. And they move in a direction of autonomy. So you can go in either direction from any one of those places. Right. So, so it is not a so developmental they're, they're the continuum. They're the same. They're basically equal at all stages of development. Well, Everybody there, needs there all There is evidence three in seven. relation to ego development that people who are higher in levels of ego development are more likely to spend more of their time in autonomous, motivated yeah, okay. states. That's true. So we get more of but, it as we yeah. evolve as human but beings. But this is not a developmental continuum. Right. OK, good. OK, thank you. OK, so there was a question. Oh, we have lots of questions. Does anybody, anybody else have a mic back there? OK, so let's start. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. This has already been very helpful. Um, I specifically had a question around uh, when, you, when you gave the example of the, let's say, manager that has a team where they've fostered an environment or maybe even inherited an environment or a company culture where they feel they have to control or the, or the employee won't, won't actually right. do do something. What kind of intervention methods do you suggest for someone who really wants to change that? Yeah. The, fir the first thing you know, if, if our predictions are right and you c walk into a company atmosphere where everything's been done through control and through power dynamics, um, you can't just remove all that. Because what happens when you remove all that, which is you have no regulation at all. It's all been externally regulated, and now there would be no regulation. I've seen a lot of school experiments that have gone awry in just this way, which is taking kids from highly structured authoritarian schools and putting them in a free school environment. They think, no rules? Great. 
<laughs> off they off they go. Uh, the same is true in corporations. So, the, you know, the first thing is taking stock of that. If you're walking into that situation and you see that that's the atmosphere, you know something already about uh, the workplace morale, the motivations of the people that are going on there. And so, if you want to change that, I think you have to do that in steps and in stages. And that's going to start by changing the nature of the structure and the contingencies. And it's also going to change every day on the nature of the relationship and the responsiveness of the manager to people. I think it doesn't take that many interpersonal reactions in which an employee actually feels responded to and their initiative recognized and their talents acknowledged that they feel differently about you as a manager than the person who was there before. So it's this, it's this introducing of a new climate in not a radical way by changing all the rules at once, by slowly changing that structure into a, uh, one that's more autonomy supportive, along with an interpersonal atmosphere that backs that up. Because one thing that happens is we see in corporations a lot, these new initiatives, somebody's got a new plan, a new bonus system, a new thing that they stick in it that they think is somehow motivating. And even if it's based on some sound principles, which it usually is not, but even if it is, if the atmosphere has been controlling, then the intent is perceived as controlling and people are resistant to it anyway. So even programs that are often good for employees ultimately will be resisted because it's seen as another instrument of control. And I can't tell you how many consulting situations I've walked into where essentially the set that's been given to people is, we've got a big problems here and Dr. Ryan's going to straighten it out. <laughs> <sighs> what a horrible way to begin because it already sets me up as an expert for them to be resistant to, and it already says I'm carrying out a corporate agenda that's going to be done to rather than something that's done with. Uh, so the set is, uh, is an issue that always has to be worked with and appreciated. There's reasons people are resistant to change, and we should, uh, we should love hearing about them. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we'll just have to jump around here. I'll try to do a section. Thank you very much. It's been great. But I just wanted you to talk a little bit more about um, rewards. Um, I did use rewards with one of my children, and it was just briefly, he was misbehaving in church, and so I'd say, when, if you behave well in church, we can go. Yeah. And it was like during the children's uh, um, minute or whatever. So it, he, you know, just, I felt like he learned that he can behave. Yeah. He knows how. Yeah. You know? But um, I, last year I taught on a adolescent, uh, psychiatric adolescent unit. And there were no rewards. And, and they would sleep all day. And they were really, you know, driven mostly by their peers a lot of the time. And a lot of them were falling way behind in school, like years. Yeah. And I felt that was really harmful. Yeah, I agree. So I want, I want to make a distinction here that really applies to the adolescent unit you just spoke about. So what you said is that there was an adolescent unit in which there were no rewards, but it also sounds like there was nothing else going on. If they were allowed to sleep all day, not attend to their schoolwork, do nothing on that, then that's not a, a structuring environment. It's not a, a values breeding environment in any way, shape, or form. I would never argue that what autonomy support is is a lack of structure or a lack of guidance or even a lack of rules or guidelines for what to do. That has nothing to do with autonomy. As I said before, we can autonomously follow rules. We can have rules imposed on us, or we can also have rules imposed on us in a way that we also have legitimacy and reasons for doing it. So one of the things I hear in the adolescent ward is that there was nobody there who had a vision for how to positively motivate people to do activities, or even to, uh, in some way, structure it so such that activities would be engaged in. And then, um, so an absence of structure is no good to anybody. Now, you know, we've done a lot of studies on this, and. Probably the only thing worse than an absence of structure, which is worse than uh, many other conditions, is, is a controlling structure. Because controlling structure now means I don't, even, I don't really quite internalize it either. So I, you know, I did some work with a school that was called the School Without Walls. Uh, in Rochester, New York. It was a really interesting school experiment. This is one of those places where, at least when they first started, they had no rules. You didn't have to attend classes. You, you, you could go to classes if you wanted. You had to complete some requirements over time, and you graduated by demonstration. It was a great idea. But they were taking kids who had failed at other schools that were very authoritarian schools, where everything was passes in the hall, uh, punishments and rewards. So when kids first got to the school, they just did nothing. 
just like the kids on your adolescent ward. Because they said, well, now you've lifted all the controls. And they had nothing internal to go by. They had no value system for learning or anything else. So what we did is we introduced a, a system of, of structure so that they had goals that they established. Every week they met with somebody to discuss how they made progress on goals or didn't make progress on goals. And as they did that, uh, as they accomplished goals, they could be, over time, freed of the need to be meeting ongoingly and be monitored and have that discussion. But they had to have that discussion every week. Otherwise, these kids were lost. And the same would be true on that adolescent ward or anything else. I just want to get to your other brief question there about your child and the, and the reward that you gave your child. How dare you do that? That's a terrible thing to do. <laughs> Our rewards are always bad. Sometimes rewards can be used informationally. They say some, if they're small rewards and they're used symbolically to acknowledge something, they're a way of saying, I value this and I'm trying to convey to you that I value this. But I certainly would want to keep that to a minimum and withdraw it as soon as possible because the longer you're doing it through motivation of rewards, the more you have all those other negative effects that I've talked about. So as a, as a very brief uh, intervention, besides that, I would not want my kid acting out of church. That's terrible. <laughs> so uh, if it worked in the moment, then uh, I could see a short-term efficacy for that. But. So I think I Thank you very much for those uh, great presentation. Uh, I'm Dr. Semakin from Turkey. Uh, I am physician, also coach, and I realize that this self-determination theory is very important for well-being and uh, health coaching. Uh -huh. And uh, I am uh, wondering about if there is any work have have done on weight loss subject. You said uh, this is the similar uh, subject is going on smoking quit, uh, the same subject, but it's different because there is a dietitian on the weight loss, weight loss journey. How can we put this autonomy uh, theory in this weight loss if the patient, if the people uh, keep their autonomy during this weight loss journey? Mm -hmm. How does it affect on this their relation with the food and behavior. Right. Thank you. There's been, uh, the, the question is really about uh, weight loss interventions and how, uh, how could they be done in a way that's not controlling and, and also be successful in some way. And actually this is an area where there's a number of STT interventions. One's now uh, three years out in its clinical trial showing huge success uh, with Portuguese uh, women who are obese, so it's a, it's a study run by Pedro Teixeira, really a wonderful study, and it contains all the elements that I would love to see in an intervention that makes it work. First, it's highly autonomy supportive, so in no way does is weight loss the goal of the study. It's the health of the women involved there. So they come to be engaged in their health group. Of course, they're all obese, so weight loss is a prominent issue for them. And so they get information, but they also get choices, menus, options of how to pursue things. Um, they're also hooked up in groups of other women who share some interest in an exercise. So trying to find act physical activity to go along with diet that's also interesting to people and then have the relatedness component be part of the support for that. What's turned out in this study is in the first four months there was a lot of clinical intervention. After that four months, the women who were already in these subgroups that were exercising together continued to support each other in weight loss over the next uh, months after that. So it was the community support they got from relatedness in an autonomy supportive setting that was really, really effective. So when you include these kinds of elements in motivation, they're really important. And I, I say that by way of even if you have a controlling person who tells you all the right things to do and you lose weight, we know what the evidence is about that, which is it's not maintained. It's lost afterwards. And there's lots of weight loss programs with immediate success and poor maintenance. Our goal is internalization, and that's what results in the long-term maintenance. And you don't get there unless you actually come to yourself, value the importance of the activities engaged in the program. So um, I don't know how to say more technically about that. There are lots of technical things that go into that. But it's been very successful in the weight loss area, which is an area notorious for poor maintenance of change processes. It's I don't think it's that hard to get people to lose weight. It's really hard for them to maintain it. And that's why internalization is so important here. And that's why the old behavioral methods have worked so poorly, is because they're associated with poor maintenance strategies. 
Thanks. Um, I had a question on um, awards and recognition. Can you hear? Um, I, I hear faintly, yeah. Okay, sorry. Uh, there you are, here. okay. No, I'm yeah. on now? Okay. So on rewards and recognition, you mentioned that um, rewards when uh, certain people receive rewards and recognition in public spheres, um, it's demotivating to everyone who doesn't get them. So I'm wondering what you think would be a, a really great reward and recognition program in a workplace. Um, you know, that this is something that we keep encouraging mm -hmm. workplaces to be, yeah. give people reward and recognition for good work. But I'm wondering about, is there a downside in terms of demotivating those who aren't receiving those? There's, there's lots of downsides to reward and recognition programs, and there's many upsides too. So again, it all, the devil here is in the details. Um, I want to start with a, a kind of recognition system that's very common, which we'd call a bonus system. So let's say that I have a team of employees and I decide to add a bonus system to enhance motivation. When I add a bonus system, and it could take very different structures, it could be that there's a criteria that I have in mind that everybody could reach, and that if they reach that, then there's a bonus in it. That's a competency-based criteria, at least. Another kind of bonus system is the person who does the best here will get the big bonus. Whoever sells the most, or whoever makes the most widgets, or whoever sees the most patients, or whatever the metric is. That kind of bonus system, I think, has many, many negative effects. It has negative effects on the person who gets the bonus, because after they've done all this work, and then they get the bonus, they think, that's what I did this for? <laughs> I mean, it's a common reaction in this. I'm just going to give you a personal example of that is, I remember one time when I got a teaching award at my university. And they never gave money, financial awards for it. But I think the year I did it, they decided on a financial reward for this. And I'm a person who studies the undermining effect of financial rewards on behavior. But they gave me $2,000, I think it was, for my teaching award. And I think of how much effort I put into teaching and how the long, long hours I spend preparing and the work I do in caring for the students. And I looked at that check and I thought, $2,000? <laughs> and now I never thought about it in that terms before until they did that. I also want to say the other thing, though. All the people in my department who didn't get the award that year, they know it doesn't go to the, our department every year. So they all thought, OK, done for me now for a while. And then their efforts are undermined. Some of them even told me it felt terrible for you to get the award because I felt like I had been trying for that and now I'm giving up. And this happens a lot. Competitively contingent rewards given to one person can often dash the hopes of other people, lead to greater feelings of incompetence, lead to intergroup competition, lead to lack of cooperation on work teams. There's so many spillover effects for zero-sum game, single bonus structures that are given to people. On the other hand, if everybody can get the bonus because there's an actual criteria that we can see and do, then that can be more competency based and then people can all feel good about that and then if there's somebody but then if there's somebody who can't make that I don't want that to be public but I do want to go in and help diagnose with them what went wrong so that that can be informational rather than controlling and not humiliating the trouble with bonuses is that they're often publicly humiliating to everybody who doesn't get them I have to go home to my wife and tell her I didn't get the bonus that the other guy got that's humiliating and it makes me feel incompetent and less motivated for my work. We, I want to go on this another way. Grades in school, we think of them as motivational devices. How many people in here actually think giving people a low grade has motivated students more? It never motivates them. It demotivates them. And that's just what bonuses do in workplaces. Recognition is a different thing now altogether. Because recognition is an, an acknowledgment of competence. And if it's not used in a controlling way, in other words, we're not giving the prizes out contingently for doing what I want, then it actually is a thing that boosts motivation for most people. Now, it has its limits, though, when it's a zero-sum game again, and only some people can get recognition, and many people have no pathway there. Then it won't be motivating for them. So this is all by way of saying, when you think about a bonus system, you have to think carefully about it. Um, they cost a lot of money, and then once you institute them, you've got to do a lot of monitoring and evaluation in order to make it fair and reasonable. You've also got to make sure the, le the playing field is level, or else the perception of inequity and unfairness will blow up in your face with the bonus system. And I, you know, I think here about sales bonuses, but some people have the easy sales district, and some people have the one where it's very hard to sell. That's not a fair bonus system because the playing field isn't level. I've just seen those blow up in managers' faces before. So, 
I would want to think very seriously about why I'm instituting such a system, what I'm using it for, what my intent is, and whether it's going to generate those kinds of sense of inequity or withdrawal of effort, because these things can happen from the seemingly positive systems of reward. With all that said, sometimes reward is a good thing to do. Um, sometimes acknowledgement enhances somebody's feeling that, yeah, I've been recognized for all that I've put in here, and that feels good. Uh, when it's done in that way, it can be effective and positive. I think we need it a lot less than we think we do. Yeah. Oh. How would you regulate self -regulate? I'm sorry, I didn't. Rewarding self Personal goals, rewarding yourself, making personal goals. Yeah, um, self-reward strategies have been, have been studied a lot, actually, you know, so if I, if I promise myself a certain reward, like if I can finish this talk without falling over, I'll let myself have a beer. Actually, that might make me fall over, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, if we invent little reward systems like that, the first thing I'd wonder for myself is, why, why do I need that? What's that getting me? And does that tell me something about my motivation for doing this activity? I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it's an opportunity for reflection. Is first, why do I even need to create that structure for myself? Um, I, I do think, on the other hand, most of the time when we're doing that kind of thing, we're, we're basically saying, I have something to look forward after this miserable experience is over. That's why I want the reward on the other side of it. So that's why I say it should breed some reflection in us about the activities we're engaged in. If we need to do that a lot, we're probably in the wrong profession <laughs> uh, if we need to do a lot of self-rewarding. Um, there's bit, the evidence on self-rewarding, whether it's looked at, whether it undermines or uh, enhances intrinsic motivation, has been quite uh, ambiguous, I would say. Uh, sometimes self-reward appears to feel more autonomous to people, and so it doesn't undermine as badly as other reward does, but sometimes it undermines just as badly. In my experiments, it's undermined just as badly. Now, I take it a step further. We self-reward ourselves a lot. Uh, with pride and with sh uh, we punish ourselves a lot with shame and this is what introjection is it's really the internal self reward and self punishment basis and as I've tried to argue before and shown with evidence I think that it's an unstable form of motivation we'd want to move to a more stable one based in value for the activity and real reasons for doing it that aren't extrinsic to it um, so I hope that answers it I just want to note that we may have more questions than time even though we've still got 20 minutes and this I'm, I'm group, hoping this other group already broke out over here yeah, how no, let them out no, no, we're no. in competition no, with them no, you know? they're, uh, they're. <laughs> so I I just want to um, pl uh, leave a um, plant a seed that I, I suspect all of us would love to have a, a, an evening with Rich to talk about all of our motivational challenges, our own and others. Um, and I'm wondering whether we can't start a dialogue around this using the um, um, Institute LinkedIn group and somehow maybe keep you in this loop with us. So I know we may not get to all the questions. So I just want to make sure we really want to hear them and, and let us send them to um, info at instituteofcoaching.org. Them that I said to you to do that, and we'll figure out a way to keep. Uh, keep okay, I just want to say one thing about this being my first time at a coaching convention. It's my first time interacting really with uh, coaches outside of circles of positive psychology. Um, partly, I got into this a little bit. I was very receptive to the invitation because I really, really do think this is a hugely important profession as it's developing. There is no equivalent for it out there. I am a clinical psychologist. That's not an equivalent. We deal with pathology. We deal with severe depression and other kinds of issues, and I think that there's a place for that. But there's also a place for facilitating development, and that's a different set of skills than is sometimes needed. Well, I think you need those two as a clinician, but it's a different set of skills and knowledge bases in different contexts. So I'm just thrilled that the coaching profession is developing as it is and in this professional manner. And um, I just want to say thanks for inviting me here. I was glad to be invited to come to this conference. So Great. That does mean the world to us, so thank you. Okay, so uh, I know I heard it. Just go here. Well, I think we'll jump around front and back. So uh, I wanted to ask you a question about the place of meaning in flourishing, because at the start of your presentation, you identified the three basic drives and said, you know, why not four or five? Could be meaning, but <laughs> no. Is that because it lives partly in autonomy, acting yes. in congruence with our values and beliefs, or if not, 
what role does it have to play in flourishing? Well, I think you, the, the question was why is meaning not a fourth basic psychological need? And of course, we have considered this deeply and we've written about this some. In part, when we've done studies where we measure meaning, independently of the other need satisfactions, the variance in it gets taken up by autonomy, just as you say, and relatedness. Why? Because most of the things we find meaningful lie in our relationships and uh, relatedness satisfactions, and most of the things that we uh, have a great deal of passion and value for are the things that are meaning, so autonomy takes up that space, so to speak. So it doesn't really add something in the overall prediction of well-being. That said, meaning is really important because it is an expression of autonomy, it is an expression of our competence, and it's an expression of our connection to the human community. So I in no way diminish the value of meaning. I think meaning, when you have meaning, all of your basic needs are being satisfied. And the search for meaning is often the search for the satisfaction of those same basic needs. So you know, I've had a lot of discussions with Paul Wong uh, about uh, this stance that we take where he thinks we're kind of reducing meaning to the basic needs. But I think, no, it's that the basic needs fuel that drive that we call the meaning drive. And, uh, and it's very important to all of us to have that sense of purpose uh, and goals in life that, uh, that we call meaning. I guess just one other thing I'd add to that, when we look at people's life goals and what they think is meaningful, some turn out to be better than others <laughs> in terms of generating need satisfaction. So. Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? Hi. Are I'm tired, but good. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you have experience with this or not. Workplaces that are um, reducing, have a reduction in force. Yeah. Um, I work for an employee assistance program, and so we get calls from HR you know, quick, get us your change packet, or quick, put a packet together. And I feel like the message that we're getting is, if you could just put this packet together, then the people that are leaving will be okay, and the people that are staying will be okay, or could you come and talk to the people that are staying? How does a workplace motivate mm -hmm. employees when there are layoffs going on? Yeah, well, it's out of their first, first, when layoffs are going on, it is a huge, issue in corporate climate. So I, actually the Fortune 500 company that we were working with was in the middle of massive layoffs while we were doing that intervention. So we, we felt it up close and personal during that time, but it's also true in other companies we've been engaged with since. When people are being laid off around you, everything is at risk. So the stakes are high, and the normal human response to that is to stick your head low. Right? You, they, we always say the tallest tree is the one that's going to get cut off. <laughs> and so oftentimes what you see is people ducking under just those circumstances, which is really kind of sad because they're also withdrawing energy and creativity from the company during those very times when the company probably needs it the most. It's also uncertainty because you, you don't know about your future and insecurity. And this is one place where the security need now does kind of rear its head. We call it a, a deficit need. And now it becomes an organizer of behavior rather than the basic psychological needs. So you're not positively motivated. You're motivated in a self-protective manner. So there's also lots of feelings of inequity and unfairness and distrust in corporations that goes on at those times because those decisions aren't always transparent. And sometimes when they are transparent, it's even worse. So those kinds of issues are obviously affecting everybody's morale in the company at the same time. So a question that I often have is how can an individual manager put an umbrella up under that kind of storm? How can they help the people feel need satisfaction within their small unit of that uh, industry given what's coming down from outside. And of course, you know, there's all, all the techniques go into that uh, in, in terms of doing it, but there's no way to do that without acknowledging what's going on around the other corporate atmosphere. And I think acknowledging it really rather than trying to run it over with lots of programs or lots of uh, gimmicks or, or buzzes and distractions, because that doesn't really work. I think at all. I do want to say this as a change agent, and you all know this probably personally. When you're the person who's charged with being a change agent, it's usually because something's wrong, <laughs> and you're the one who's stepping into that. And so we should expect resistance. We should, all, we should invite and respect resistance. And the resistance is always informative. If we don't avoid the resistance, instead we go toward the resistance, we find out the heart of the issues almost right away. People should be resisting us. If they have any self-respect, they should be resisting us. <laughs> because who are we as we come in with our expertises and our roles and our knowledge base or whatever that is? Because they know it's about changing them. And of course, none of us would like this. I wouldn't like somebody coming to my workplace and saying, hey, 
we know how to change you rich for the better. They're gonna get resistance <laughs> from that. So I think appreciating that, especially at that time of, of uncertainty, is really, really important. Nobody should uh, be expected to want to assimilate new change programs at that time. So I would begin by acknowledging that resistance before doing anything, and then being as autonomy supportive I can in anything that's been instituted as a change. And then you get more buy-in. One thing I like is we're all trained in classrooms to look at the teacher when we raise our hand, but I don't have the microphone, so it doesn't do anything. <laughs> uh, so my understanding of SDT that started in the 1970s around understanding what motivates people in particular situations, and you were talking today about the correlation with flourishing in life in general. And I guess my question is, have you really developed a generalized theory of human flourishing? And I guess, uh, it, what would be elements of flourishing that aren't included in self-determination theory? Hmm. Well, I'm sure there's things that are not included. Um, the theory's developed, as you, as you pointed out, I think really kind of rudely and crudely that it was started in the 1970s because it shows just how old I am. <laughs> no, but it's true. it's true. We started this work in the 1970s and our work was on intrinsic motivation at the time. But I was a clinician, of course, and since most of what my patients had to endure and go through wasn't intrinsically motivated, my interest was really in how can I help them internalize a value for change. So that's how we got to the theory of internalization. As we were exploring the bases for both intrinsic motivation and uh, true internalization, we saw that those ingredients also fostered well-being. So we came up with the basic psychological needs theory around 1985 that really added to that and then tried to explore. And then people objected. They said, well, there's developmental and cultural constraints on that. So that began the cross-cultural work to see what was universal and culturally specific in human flourishing and in what makes people well. There's been other additions to that, the goal theory was added to that in the 1990s as we got to explore what life goals uh, produce different kinds of satisfaction. So it grew into that uh, during the 1990s. And then I would say in the, in the uh, around 2000, we started to get interested in the function of awareness as a foundation for autonomy. So that's when we began the study of mindfulness when Kirk Brown came to study with us at Rochester. Uh, and we began that work. So um, there's other chapters in this theory, but it's been a slowly evolving and ongoingly expanding theory as well as into the domains into which we've, uh, we've come. So it's changed in its focus and it's changed in its dynamics. And part of that's because you know, there's now a thousand researchers around the world who are using this framework and they keep expanding it. All of the developments that I've ever engaged in are really because we actually run an autonomy supportive shop ourselves. So the reason the theory keeps evolving is students come in and they have an interest that they want to flourish with and we try and facilitate that happening and they lead us in some new directions. So in that sense, I do think it's evolved. Is it a complete theory of flourishing? Well, I think it's as complete as any that I know are out there. And I want to say one of the reasons I got into the language of flourishing and eudaimonia in 1999, a book came out that I found intellectually objectionable. And it was a book uh, by uh, Nobel Prize winner Kahneman, Schwartz, and Diener, and it was called Well-Being, the Hedonic Approach. And basically, if you read that book in detail, what it does is it reduces the concept of well-being to the concept of happiness. And I don't see those two as the same. And so I wrote an annual review. I happened to be that year invited to do an annual review in psychology on happiness. So I wrote a review about the Aristotelian tradition and happiness, Carol Riff's work, Alan Waterman's work, our work, as a different view than the hedonic view. Because we don't think uh, wellness is the same thing as happiness. I'm OK with happiness being positive affect and the absence of negative affect. But that's not wellness. Wellness is a fully functioning human being. It's a person who can grieve when things are sad. It's a person who can be angry when things are offensive. It's a person who can have positive emotions when the situation calls for it. That's fully functioning. I'm able to process what's actually going on in my life, take stock of it, and make use of it in self-regulated decisions. For Aristotle, this notion of living well, of living in accord with values and our excellencies, is the thing that will, on the side, produce happiness, but that's never its aim. And this is a place where I do have a little struggle with positive psychology myself. I'm glad that positive psychology has appreciated SDT's work in this realm, but I'm a I get nervous around the notion that positive, I mean, I think, uh, I, actually, I think Barbara spoke very well to this this morning in her talk, where she began the talk by saying, I don't mean a Pollyannish uh, 
positive view of the world. I don't think she does mean that either, but I do worry about that in positive psychology. It's not about being positive, it's about being real, authentic, and aware. And if you do those things, you're more likely to flourish and, as it turns out, empirically be happy. Pursuing happiness directly ends up with unhappiness, and that's just an empirical outcome of that. So, no, not a full theory of flourishing, but we're trying. <laughs> I do. I do. You know, we live in a world where there's a lot of pressures and there's also, those pressures are insidious. There's a way in which they can invade all of us. We can all start to see all of our children on some competitive racetrack and some are getting ahead of the others and oh, my mind's going to fall behind somehow as if we know what the outcome is and where they're racing to. And in order to enforce those outcomes, I'm not saying you're doing this, but the common pattern is what we call conditional regard. How do I convey to my kids they need to do better at school? I'll show them disappointment when they don't do well. I'll give them more love when they do do well. And this adds to strong interjections in them. Uh, I, was, as I, was, I was just in Asia uh, doing some talks in Hong Kong and in Singapore. Many parents were at my talks and we talked about the tiger mom as the kind of classic case of conditional regard. And spontaneously from the audience, people said, I had a tiger mom and I did well in school, but I hated most of what I did. There was a lot of lack of motivation and a lot of lack of uh, what I would call congruence in motivation as a result of that. We've been studying that in the Israeli culture as well and finding the same kind of results in Israel and Singapore and the US for conditional regard. We think we know where we're pushing our kids to, but we don't really know, and there's multiple paths. This, one of the things about modern life is it's got a lot of equifinality and twisting, turning paths. So the kid who goes to school and then becomes the doctor right away, having never reflected on what they wanted to do, can end up being an unhappy, successful person. And then there's the person who doesn't do so well in high school, but then finds their passion later on and discovers that, and then they actually live a full and eudaimonic life. So, and I, just again, to use a personal example of that, I was not a very good student when I was in high school. I barely made it into college, and the only reason I went to college is that I was too, too bad at vocational skills to go anywhere there. <laughs> uh, I couldn't fix anything or do anything, so I had to go to college. And while I was in college, I was there for two years, and I finally dropped out. There was tremendous pressure to be successful. My parents used to use nicknames for us like Doc and blah, blah, blah. Uh, try and pressure us toward that stuff. I ended up to be a dropout. My brother ended up to be a dropout. Uh, and we had to find a new way. What I will say is that when I finally came back into that universe, it was because there was a meaning there for me and something I wanted to pursue. And I'm so glad I did not listen to their pressure. But who could have predicted that? I think they would have taken that moment of my dropping out and said, I should have pressured them more. Right, because that would have been at the immediate outcome. But we don't know the long-term outcomes. I think what I want for my children, I'm sure this is true for you too, is I want them to be happy and fulfilled. How they get there is gonna be a puzzle for their life. But I think that they're gonna get there a lot easier if they know that no matter what they do, I love them anyway. Unconditionally, I'll be there behind them. No matter whether they're unemployed or employed, whether they're employed at the highest levels or they're employed at just a job that they like making coffee. Whatever that is, I'm going to love my child in that point in time. And if I give them that, that's the best foundation for all the success that they can have in life. And so I suggest that what you're doing is a lot better than the pressuring parents that you see around you. <laughs> and, uh, and I hope you keep it up. Hi. Okay. Hi. I'm on. Um, so I have a, a work, sorry, a curiosity question. So I am, I'm a nurse and a health and wellness coach at a very large company. And um, our company's been collecting a lot of information about the health, most, the emotional health and the physical health of, of the population, which is many thousands of people. And over the last two years, what we've seen when we've correlated this data, when the benefits department has correlated this data, and then I get to look at it, um, 
we've seen a lot of fairly young people who have some sort of red flags saying that they're, they're tipping into some poor health. They're not there yet, but as a population, they're going there. But the, the big thing that connects that is emotional health. Mm -hmm. The people who are at the highest yeah. risk of future health problems or in the beginning stages of, say, hypertension, high cholesterol, diabetes, um, they report the highest rates of depression, anxiety, and sadness, which was a separate That's right. yeah. measure. Mm -hmm. So in a large group of people like this, here we, we have health and wellness coaches. We have on-site wellness clinics with doctors and nurses. But when we're reaching people one at a time, I think this is, and we've been talking about focusing our work on autonomy and trying to kind of see how does this affect things. So might be a separate conversation, but um, how do you affect this kind of bigger culture change when you can really work with one person at a time? You know, if you're looking at bringing a sense of autonomy around self-care into it. I, uh, I'm, I'm a little confused on the question as to whether the question is how we can do this one person at a time or how you can do that as a big program. Well, how to make it most effective, maybe, because we're, we're working with two different things. We're working with phys physical health mm. and emotional health. Well, first I want to just comment on the physical, emotion, health connection. Um, as was pointed out this morning, if we look at most of the causes of uh, death, cancer, traffic accidents without seat belts, uh, um, alcohol-related deaths, a lot of them have to do with our own behavior. But if we look at why people are engaged in those behaviors, if we look deeply at why they're engaged in that behavior, they're often to do with emotion regulation. Why does somebody drink as much as they do? Because if they don't drink, other things will come up for them. Why do people smoke the way they do? Because they're using smoking as a way of handling emotions and regulating emotions. And by the way, it's a pretty effective way of doing that. But it turns out to have bad health benefits. So the emotion regulation and stress uh, aspects of the physical health problem are huge. They're dramatic. And I think uh, we're just in, always increasingly coming to appreciate how, how much that is. Now, the question of how to go toward those things is that I think we, it's easy to focus on health as a calling card. So getting people in the door when it's just about health, as long as there's also options there for them exploring things that they then take interest in that might have to do with emotion regulation. So teaching things like mindfulness in the context of stress reduction turns out to have benefits for emotions and for health. And teaching things about uh, self-regulation, autonomy, and need satisfaction and support helps both elements of that. And it can be done in the context of a health-related program. So there are many ways in, but the connection is a strong one, and it's a, it's a, it's a big issue. I, I don't have the microphone. I, I, I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to shout like that? <laughs> Woo! Woo! <laughs> okay, 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 okay. <laughs> I just, it was competition, I just had to. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Is this on? Hi. We've got, another, we've got five minutes. <laughs> you don't have to clap again. We've already done it, I think. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm so glad I got to ask you this question. Thank you so much. Huh. Um, I work in a clinical setting, and I'm a health coach in a clinical setting. Mm -hmm. And we, historically, we've worked with clinicians and um, tried to get them to use brief motivational interviewing techniques yeah, yeah. in the office to get them to refer to yeah. coaches. And we've used things like the motivation scale. So like asking someone, how motivated are you on a scale of one to 10 to do something about this that will help improve your health? And then if they're above this number, you refer them. And if you're below, you know, and, and everything you've said today makes me think we should not be doing that. Well, and, or maybe we, I, do, I do want to say you should not be doing that. Or and <laughs> your, your opinion about that. Um, is there maybe a better way to do that? Well, well, first, you know, this, this habit comes about because of stages of change theory. And stages of change said that people have either pre-contemplative or contemplative or kind of contemplating change or they're in an active thing or they're in a maintenance phase. And the recommendations from stages of change people are if people are down at the unmotivated end, you leave them alone. I'm thinking, well, 
what's that going to do for them? <laughs> if they're pre-contemplating, I would like to get them contemplating. And if they're contemplating, I'd like to get them reflective and autonomously engaged. So I think there's, we should leave nobody behind on the basis of a readiness call. That's just my personal opinion. And I don't think there's ever been any evidence, by the way. And if you notice what subtly happened in the stages of change literature is they've suddenly switched themselves from a predictor variable to an outcome variable. And why did they do that? Because they weren't good as a predictor variable. There's never been any evidence for that match hypothesis between that kind of, at least that I'm aware of. I'm aware of no evidence that suggests that it's efficacious to not to ignore the pre-contemplative and to only go after the people who are um, contemplators or active. I don't think that there's an evidence base for that. I think it's because it's so intuitive. It's like Maslow's hierarchy. It could be wrong, but it looks cool as a triangle. And stages of change has that same kind of thing. It makes intuitive sense, but it's not true. It's just not a viable model for predicting who will make a change or what they need in order to do it. So I think it is a bad practice to do that. Uh, the part of motivational interviewing, we have a lot of interface with motivational interviewing in SDT. I was actually surprised to see this kind of a motivational interviewing thing going on parallel session to us here. I think I wanted to attend that, no. Uh, <laughs> but I've been trained in motivational interviewing. We use a lot of our techniques themselves. And we've been, though, having a debate in the literature with people in motivational interviewing about what's the core of motivational interviewing. We think it's autonomy support. Some people in motivational interviewing think it's autonomy support. And th some people think it's making change happen happen. That's a divide within the motivational interview group. And I think if they don't settle on autonomy, if they go for making change happen, then it becomes a manipulative technique. And that's what I fear about MI being used as a uh, add-on before therapies. It's like, I already know what therapy you need, so I'm going to give you motivational interviewing to be motivated for it. That's not motivational interviewing. Or at least it's not autonomy supportive, because it means I already know what you need here, and I'm just trying to get you over there. And I'll amplify the discrepancies on that side of it to get you to think about that. That's against the original grain, I think, of what, that, what made that technique so powerful. So I'm hoping the motivational interview people save themselves from their own current debacle, that they go back to the notion that autonomy support is the core of what they do. It's not a technique within it. And when they do that, I think it's they'll get back to the basic practice. I worry about it as an add-on to therapies. I think it's effective. Certainly motivational interviewing helps those therapies that people don't have readiness for. Um, so I'm not saying it doesn't have some efficacy over not doing it at all. But I don't like that use of it if I've already preordained the outcome. And you'll be glad to hear that Michael Pantalon over there, um, if you look at his slides, it's all about autonomy support. Is it? So, yeah, so that's a good thing. All right, I'm, not, I'm not gonna, change talk. It's actually just about time to quit, but I, I would love to ask you the question, what's next for you? What are the questions on your mind right now in, the re, in terms of your research and your interests, your, uh, your autonomy-supported interests? Well, I would say that my research is driven by my students, so I could tell you what they're up to and then how I'm trying to support them in that. Uh, we're doing a lot of work on stigma and how stigma affects people and then how autonomy supportive environments can help stigmatized populations better uh, adapt and, and, uh, and thrive. Uh, we're doing a lot of work, therefore, on the opposite end of that bullying and rejection. So we're looking at what's the atmosphere in schools that conduces to bullying and looking at how schools can be formulated, democratic schools and autonomy supportive schools to minimize bullying. Uh, we're doing work on dual process theory, so we're looking at uh, both implicit and explicit motives and values and what breeds congruence between them. A lot of our work there is in mindfulness and how mindfulness can create more congruence between implicit and explicit uh, processes, in other words, more authentic, real behavior in people uh, coming about because of awareness and, and coordinating that uh, within ourselves. I'm doing a lot of cross-cultural work now. I do work with the Singapore schools. And uh, then from Singapore, we're launching to many projects in China because uh, it's very important there to support autonomy in schools, particularly in a burgeoning uh, democracy, I mean, hopefully a burgeoning democracy in at least Hong Kong. Um, and Singapore is what it is. And uh, so that's just some of the work uh, that I'm up to. Um, Self-determination work never <laughs> ends, and that's a beautiful thing about it. So I hope there's a lot more to come. Well, you just keep supporting more autonomy, which just generates more questions, that's and right. it keeps going. True. So true. let's give Rich one great big hand.